Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And we have in the last couple of days the opening of the trial uh, against a hospital uh, where the family believes that they did many inappropriate things leading to many disastrous uh, events. And this is all based on uh, this. Um, if anybody's been up on the Netflix show, it's very popular. It came out earlier, but now that the trial is out, everybody's watching it. It's called Take Care of Maya. And I did see that. And if you're just coming to the show, you're not in the chat room, you're coming to the show as a public later, I uh, haven't seen that, you might want to stop the video, go look at it, come back. Um, because it's very interesting. And it's also very, the whole issue is so very complicated. And so it's going to take a bit for me to try to help people understand things. Now, this is an educational channel. I say this all the time uh, because I use many techniques to get people to understand stuff that maybe they aren't familiar with. Uh, sometimes I use personal stories, which I'm going to use today. Um, and sometimes I go into depth on certain things. And I have had people say, well, could you just get to the point? <laughs> <laughs> you know, do a Dr. Grande, do, do 15 minutes. Of, no. And he, I like his channel. He's, 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 he's funny. He's got a great sense of humor. And sometimes he does point out some really useful things. So I'm not against his channel at all. I do promote it. Uh, but my channel is different. I'm an educational channel. So people come here and want to learn a little bit more in depth. It's kind of like the difference between writing a textbook and writing a text. Okay, if you don't have any energy to stay with the show past the text, <laughs> you're in the wrong place. <laughs> so, because this is a complicated case, I really want you to understand all the different aspects involved in this. And because I worked in a hospital for 13 years of my life as a medical sign language interpreter, I was like a fly on the wall to a lot of things that I saw happening. I saw Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is one of the issues in this case. I also saw medical staff, which I wasn't pleased with. I've seen social work. I've seen psychology. I've had to sit there sometimes and just keep, keep interpreting while I wanted to punch somebody in the face, you know, because I thought it was horrific. I've seen horrific medical advice. I've seen horrific psych psychological stuff. Some stuff has been bad. So, but then again, I, I've seen great stuff in the hospital too, good doctors, good nurses. So I have a very varied opinion. And so I'm also going to give you some of my own experiences with that were concerning. Okay. So I want to, I'm going to end up starting with that so you can see where I'm coming from and understand also what I know. And then I'll move on to the case. Um, before I start, I want to welcome those who are in the chat room. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to, I want to say up front, this is such a contentious case. It brings up so many emotions. Please try to control yourselves uh, because I'm going to go through so many different things that I want you to hold a lot of opinions till the end. Um, but you know, get, don't get so, you know, people get very upset sometimes. They say one thing, they're like, oh my God. And they haven't waited out to see what other things I'm going to add in. So I'm going to request that you do that. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for being here. If you, by the way, if you'd like to be in the chat room before I say hello to everybody, um, the chat room is patron only chat room. It's paid. Uh, so you join Patreon. It's five bucks a month. You can come to eight live shows. You can skip advertising. You support this educational channel, um, which I do appreciate tremendously. Uh, and we have a great community and yeah, it's five bucks a month. And then after the show, after I do the live show with patron patrons only, then it goes public. All of my videos are public. There's nothing hidden. So there's, there's, and if you don't want to join, you're still going to see everything. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel like the video and also hit the bell for notifications. It's very important. There are other ways to support this educational channel, buying one of my books below or clicking that little dollar sign. It helps because I just got demonetized on the last two videos I did, <laughs> which doesn't help much. And, um, and sometimes that happens. YouTube decides that subject matter is too upsetting to the advertisers, which is kind of funny to me because it's just not upsetting to people watching. It's the advertisers. I don't get it, but okay. You know, you got to go by the rules, right? So anyway, so I want to thank everybody for being here who are in the chat room. Um, uh, I also want to say thank you for being here early today. Normally my shows are later, and I know some of you, it's 11 
It's 11 a.m. EST. I know some of you who are on the West Coast are not thrilled about this. Believe me, I'm not thrilled about being here at 11 o'clock, but I have my granddaughter's soccer game scheduled in. And so I'm here with I'm here with coffee because I know I, I stay up to like three or four in the morning. So this is not fun. And I have a mouse that is living under my bed and rummaging through my the, the drawer next to my right on the, on the bed stand and making tons of noise. And I can't catch it. I've got a I got a big one of those big pails out and trying to catch a stupid mouse. And it man it went in twice, but I managed to get out. I can't figure out how it did it. So and I open a drawer and it just looks up at me and goes, hi. And then it jumps in. I, I'm trying not to kill it, but. I didn't get any sleep last night. So anyway, welcome everybody who's in the chat. I'm not going to go through all your names because I'm, but uh, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, let's get to this, uh, the issues here. All right. So as far as we're talking about here, a, a, a strange case. And you, you have this little girl at the time, Maya, who was, I believe, let, me, let me read you the basics of the case. And then I'm going to go into some explanations about the two sides, which is the family side and the medical side. All right. So anyway, the, the case has just gone into a Florida court. It started on Thursday and they, they sued, the family has sued and took them like, my God, it's been like four to five years. They've been fighting to get this into court. And here's a whole, I'm not going to get into the crappy legal system because I think that's outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And this is the, the game this system plays to, you know, we're talking about, so we have two different issues here. One is, one is, uh, did the hospital do wrong things that caused disastrous things to happen? That's one thing. That's what the lawsuit's about. But then we have a whole nother issue. It's a David and Goliath issue. We have a little family against a huge, monstrous organization who ha that have untold amounts of money. I mean, massive amounts of money. And then you have the family. So it, it, it's, it, and then the system is so stacked in, in, in the direction of people who have the money because they can get these lawyers to just keep playing and playing and playing the game over and over and over again, delaying, delaying, delaying to try to drive the people who are suing them away and they're going to just finally give the frick up, you know? So that's a whole nother thing. I'm not, I'm not going to be here to talk about the horrible legal system, which I think it is. I'm also not going to talk about entirely the, the huge medical system run by the insurance companies and the drug companies in my personal opinion, because I'm trying to keep this not to be a political channel. So, <laughs> so I'm not talking about that. What I want to talk about is, what happened to the family and what happened with the, the medical staff at the hospital? Did, did the family, were, were the medical staff at the hospital reasonable in what they determined or were they unfair to the family than causing a whole bunch of things to snowball? So let me read you what happened here. All right. The Kowalski family. Uh, where's the Kowalski family? Let me show you the Kowalski family. But, okay. So uh, here, here's the Kowalski family. Uh, this is uh, the little girls on the left, Maya. She's not a little girl anymore. She's an adult now. Um, and then we have uh, her father and her mother. Her mother is Beata. Yeah, Beata. And then it's her brother over there. He's also, I think, mostly an adult now. So that's the family. All right. But the, but the, the mother is no longer with us because of circumstances during this period of time. I'll chuck that into. All right. The Kowalski family has alleged that the hospital played a role in separating uh, Beata's daughter. Here, here's Beata with her daughter. Okay, there they are. This is happier days. Beata and her daughter, uh, Maya. Uh, they're alleging that the hospital played a role in separating Beata's daughter, Maya, from her family, which contributed to Beata's death. Uh, she took her own life during this period of time. All right. At the hearing, which was broadcast live, uh, Maya appeared in a black lady. I don't care about that. All right. I'm not doing, I'm not doing the, uh, <laughs> the news portion. All right. All right. Let me get you the basics of the case. There's no Wikipedia page. And I know people go, oh, why she uses Wikipedia because she doesn't do any research. No, I use Wikipedia so I can give you a simple outline. Not because I haven't done anything else, folks. Um, 
not 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 my patrons you understand me but some people come in and go my goodness she doesn't look at anything else yeah i do a lot i do a lot of research i just use wikipedia because it's clear and simple just for informing people of the basics okay in 2015 so this is from people they're they're a much better source right okay in 2015 Maya was diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome. Also, the, acro the abbreviation, is it abbreviation or acronym? I always forget these. I think it's an abbreviation. CRPS, a rare neurological condition that can cause excruciating pain in response to the slightest touch. People reported previously. Oh, okay. Uh, she was administered a ketamine treatment by a Tampa doctor who specializes in CRPS. So in 2015, um, let me try to, I'm, I don't want to do like massively long thing on this, but essentially in 2015, she began to have problems and she was taken to doctors and this one doctor determined that she had C CRPS and that ketamine treatments, which is, just, which is very controversial, would be good, good to use with her. All right. So she got those things. Uh, and that was 2015, 2015 through the next year. I'll explain a little more later. In 2016, Maya was checked into the Children's Hospital. Um, and this is Johns Hopkins All Children Hospital um, for debilitating stomach pain. Hospital staff would go to on to report Beata to authorities after she requested Maya be treated with ketamine, saying the drug had been effective for Maya in the past. So mom comes into the hospital. Well, for, uh, dad actually took her to the hospital. But the mom shows up and says, whoa, 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 she needs ketamine. She's been on this for a year. This is the treatment we're using. We want her on ketamine. That's what's going to suck. That's going to lessen the pain for her. Hospital didn't go for it. Uh, they, 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 they questioned the very high doses of ketamine that the mom wanted. Uh, they, they had problems with her affect, shall we say, her the way she was behaving and treating the staff and talking to them. So uh, what happened was they, an investigative team later accused Beata of child abuse due to Munchausen syndrome by proxy, uh, a mental disorder. It's, it's not a mental disorder. It's psychopathy. All right. So they got that wrong because they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a behavior of psychopathy. It is not a mental disorder. All right. Uh, psychopaths have different ways of behaving. And one of the ways that female psychopaths have of behaving uh, is getting power and control through harming or killing either their own children or patients, some someplace where they can control things and get attention and that thrill. Uh, and that behavior is called Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, Munchausen syndrome, if, if they do it to themselves, uh, Sherry Papini, for example, like, oh, I got kidnapped and was tortured. No, <laughs> that's Munchausen syndrome, but she's still a psychopath who lies and makes up the story about herself. But Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when you do it to others. And a good portion of time it is to your own children um, or somebody in your care. Um, so it's not it's not a mental disorder, it's psycho psychopathy. But often most of the pe people who do this kind of thing are female, female psychopaths. So they're saying that she's got Munchausen syndrome by proxy or it displays it, shall I say. Uh, in which a caregiver affects or causes symptoms to make a child look sick. And I'm going to get into the issue of was she encouraging Maya to fake sim symptoms? Like, want, like, in other words, to get attention from mommy, do, I, do you have to have these symptoms so that I will then pay more attention and we can go to the doctor and everything? We can all be, we can be a team, la da da da. Or, or was she causing damage to her child, actually giving her some kind of medication or, or something that caused some of her symptoms? These are the two possibilities. However, there's a third possibility. I think this one is not spoken of anywhere, and it bugs me because this is a third possibility. Keep this in mind as we go through all this. The third possibility is she actually has the disease. And wait, wait, when I'm going to get into it, it's, not, it's, it's a syndrome, which is very confusing to people, but she has symptoms and and that she is she has symptoms shall we say that 
A syndrome is where you can't prove exactly what they've got through tests, but they have these symptoms that line up with a certain thing. And it's very difficult for people um, when you have one of those situations because you go to the doctor and you say, I, I have these symptoms. And they go, yeah, you're you know, cuckoo in the head. Um, yeah, you know, you, you gotta, you, you're, just, you're just stressed. You just you have anxiety. And a lot of times these things are downplayed. But yet these symptoms are very severe. And of, oftentimes many, many people have the same exact symptoms, which is why they call it a syndrome. Can't prove it with tests. You can do exclusion tests, like you can take a test and say, okay, it's not that. But it's hard to say it's exactly what it is. So a group of symptoms will then be given a name and it's called the syndrome. Doesn't mean it's not real. It's just that it's hard to prove. And this is also important when it comes down to dealing with doctors and, and hospitals. All right. So the third one, which I want to explain, is that she could also have the actual that is a proper diagnosis that she has this syndrome, but mom could also help exaggerate that syndrome or make it worse. So that's another whole issue because then you get into a real gray area. It's gray area is like, does she, you know, wow, what, what's really going on here? I'll, I'll get into some more of that later, but I want you to understand that. So they accused the, the, the staff started believing within a week Less than a week of being hospitalized, Maya would be placed under state custody in the hospital. So what happened was the, the, the staff there, certain people, be, began to believe in a very short period of time that she might be controlling her daughter, doing things to her daughter, and wanting the ketamine because that was some, some Munchausen syndrome proxy thing going on here, and she was actually harming her daughter and in that case, what they do is they go to they go to the authorities and they say, look, we need to separate the two of them so that we can, first of all, she doesn't harm her further or take her out of the hospital and continue to harm her. And we also need to see whether with mom out of the picture and not there with her, influencing her and being in the room with her, whether we can give diagnose her, give a good treatment and see whether she improves because now she doesn't have the influence of her mother. That was the idea. The state agreed with us. And they put a three month, it was a three month essentially hold in the, in the hospital. They, 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 the hospital became her foster parent, shall we say. And uh, some people call it medical kidnapping. And I will, I will share some experiences. So um, they, I see where people are coming from with that. Other people will say, well, what are you going to do? You're trying to save this child's life. And what if she is what she is? So maybe the separation will help determine that. And that's useful. So anyway, without any contact with her daughter, Beata, Beata okay, so she wasn't allowed to go to the hospital and hug her. I do believe that she had some level of communications through video and phone. And, some, and I'm not quite sure how deep that was because the trial is just beginning and I don't have all that info. Um, her... Her, she was, Beata was deteriorating. Um, it destroyed the mother of two when a judge denied a request to hug Maya. So in January, 2017, she was, this was been 90 days and about the 87th day without being able to see her daughter and stress from the accusations of abuse, Beata took her life. And um, she, she, she sent, she had this e email um, which she, let me see if I'll find the email. <laughs> oh, am I, am I losing things again? Stupid little pictures. I swear to God. Um, <laughs> they're hard to see, and I want to put it up. And i got to figure out where it is now. <laughs> Not that. All right. Hold on a second. I have to look on a bigger screen so I can try to see what, where the which one it is. It's so annoying. I, I wish Green StreamYard would make these things big, but you can't actually read. When you have words in there, you can't actually see it. It's very frustrating. So I'm going to try to find it because I want you to see the mother's words. Um, hold on one second. Uh, okay, it should be this one. <laughs> okay, so this was, uh, by the way, she, she's originally from, uh, she, she's not American born. Her English is a little bit, 
sometimes a little bit more difficult. Uh, Beata Kowalski wrote to the judge. She said, by taking the side of the hospital and, and the, and the uh, social services, you have destroyed my family, my marriage, and you're putting us through bankruptcy, and you still deny it to me to see my daughter in court today. Then, on that fateful day, she said, Further, you let them continue to destroy even more slowly each day. My daughter will never be who she was before October 13, 2060. Now, this is important. Remember, she's saying that the treatment she's getting in the hospital because she's not getting the ketamine is killing her, essentially. And that her daughter's going to be maybe permanently harmed or, or not, or, or something that she's not going to survive because of the, of the improper treatment. So that's what she's saying because of this. And this is, again, something important to remember. I hope you take responsibility for my daughter's physical deconditioning, worsening of her CRPS that eventually will lead to her slow, painful death. Remember this because this plays into what I'm going to say is part of the issues of what's going on in this case. Then uh, then she wrote this on that fateful day. She wrote this, this email. Please take care of Maya and tell her how much I love her every day. Please tell tell Kyle that's the, the son. Also that I love him very much, and I hope that he grows up to be a strong, good man, has great future, and stays close to God. I'm sorry, but I no longer can take the pain of being away from Maya and being treated like a criminal. I cannot watch my daughter suffer in pain and getting worse. It's been three months today of Maya not being home. I love you all. And by the way, it was like three days to the end of the three months, that was the actual, there, there would be another hearing and something else would go on. So anyway, and I love you all. So this is what the, the family is suing the hospital for, that they they uh, basically kidnapped the child for three months uh, with, the, with the courts, the court agreed with this. And, and the mother was refused to allow to be physically with her um, and make decisions for her took away her rights as a parent, essentially. And uh, after, even though the three months was just coming to a close, for some reason, she decided to not be around. Okay. So, all right. Now I'm going to, I want to do, before I go into more details on the case, I want to give my little bit about where I'm coming from. Uh, so you can understand both of where, you know, I have, it's weird. It's like you, you need to be as a profiler, very objective in any of these cases. If you're also any, any of these situations, you should be objective. However, we all come in with experiences that affect how we understand the situation. And people would like to say, well, we, you know, none of that matters, but, or you shouldn't even think about that. No, it doesn't work that way. We, the way, if you're looking at a case, for example, and the case takes place for, let's say I'm, I'm analyzing a case from another country. I've never been there. I don't know the culture. I have a much more difficult time understanding what might've happened than if I spent time in that location, knew the people, knew the culture. Um, so, and sometimes if I don't, I have to go talk to people who do know that because I'm, I, I'm clueless. So a lot of people have not had issues with the medical system. They have not had issues with the social service system. They, or they, so they do not understand what's going on. They do not see different things that are happening. Um, I've had experiences with both. So I'm going to share those. I'm going to try to shorten it. So y'all, you know, and then I, because I think it's important that I do have knowledge of this and I have, I've also worked in a hospital for 13 years and seen Munchausen syndrome by proxy and Munchausen syndrome. So I come from different, and I've been in profiling for, almost three decades. And I, so I've studied this as well. So I have a level of knowledge that I want to share both personal and educational. So anyway, um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to glance at this thing, uh, comments, but I want to make sure, uh, that, and then some of them I'm not going to read simply because I know this is, you know, sometimes people get, um, you know, it's it, it's one it's a it's one of these things which you know it's such a sad thing whatever happened is sad so um, it's hard to stay just you know unemotional but we are we should be unemotional discussing this because this is profiling channel not a uh, not an advocacy channel in any way so 
I'm not advocating anything here. I'm profiling. Okay, so let's get to what I want to tell you about. Okay, first of all, as I said, I've worked 13 years in hospital as a sign language interpreter. That was years ago. But um, I got to see people that had Munchausen syndrome and had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I saw the lies. I saw the manipulations. I saw a lot of times the doctors and nurses had no clue they had this. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, you're buying this crap? <laughs> and I, some of it was just amazing to watch because I knew. Because by the time I was actually, by the end of my first decade of working, I was had actually been studying profiling for for years. So I was actually already a criminal profiler and, and, and looking at these situations. So, but I, there's a lot, hospital staff is generally speaking, not trained in recognizing this. Some are, a few people might be, but in this particular case, they claim they have more knowledge and had seen this kind of thing before. And the problem is if you work in a hospital, either you don't have any knowledge and you miss it, especially when people come, some of the Munchausen's people, also are very clever to make sure they go to different hospitals so that their, their, their history doesn't really follow them. People don't recognize them. Oh, weren't you here last week? Um, but also the staff, depending on what the training, they may completely miss everything or, or they may have some training and then hone in on it because they say, well, I've seen this before. I was one of those people. I couldn't say anything because I was a, I was a sign language interpreter, right? So I couldn't, it wasn't my place to make judgments. However, I saw it a lot. I I saw it more, many, <laughs> way more than once, you know. So I would see somebody come in with Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I'm like, here we go again. Because I recognize it just like that. Um, one of the most fascinating ones I ran into was a, a young man who's a football player. He, he came in with a complete, I think it was a kidney failure. And, and his mother was in Chicago and he was in Washington, D.C., they called the mother up and said, your son is in um, the hospital and critical. And she said, oh, do you think I need to come? <laughs> so, what? <laughs> so anyway, she gets on a bus. She shows up eventually. And um, she walks in and she's like all over the nurses. Like, oh, my God, what are you doing? What, what, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Blah, blah, blah. She was just into the nurses. She was ignoring her son completely. And, I, and I'm looking at her, watching her, going, oh, my God, this is concerning. And, and then it, and, and it turned out her son had visited her just before he came back from, to Washington, D.C. So his kidney failure might have been started in Chicago where his mother was, who he was visiting. And I looked at her and I said, excuse me, to the mother. I said, are you a nurse? She said, yes. I said, work in a nursing home? She said, yes. I said, on the midnight shift. And she goes, how do you know? Because <laughs> there is a higher level of Munchausen syndrome by proxy people working as nurses on midnight shifts because it's elderly people are easy to kill. And uh, I just did a whole thing on the Austrian angels of mercy, that little group that killed lots of women in the nursing home as, and they're serial kills. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, I was, I, my concern was, did she do something to her someone who was in Chicago because of all her behaviors? But I did mention it to the staff and, uh, I don't know if they took me seriously, uh, but uh, the boy did survive. Thank God. He was, seemed like a lovely boy. So anyway, that so in the hospital, I get those experiences. But I want to share the other side, <laughs> okay? Because I think it, it's, it's, I want you to see that I see both sides. So when I'm analyzing this, I have that knowledge. All right. This is me with my husband at the time. We are divorced, but we were together for 25 years. Uh, here, here we are with my first child, that is a Jennifer. Let's see, there's a cute little baby. Um, now, I moved out to California, and I wanted to have, I was 24 years old, I wanted to have a home birth, but I couldn't find anybody to do it. Because <laughs> I moved to California and didn't have time, because I was like, I forgot, seven months pregnant or something like that. Um, and couldn't find anybody, so I found a, a doctor, and I said, hey, I want to have a natural birth. Um, and... I knew it was going to be a hospital birth. I said, I want everything natural. I don't want any drugs. I don't want any machines. I just want a natural birth. Don't do anything to me. And he agreed. I was like, oh, good. Somebody agrees with me. That's cool. So I went into labor. I went out for breakfast in labor. <laughs> but I better eat before I go. And I got to the hospital. And the, they immediately started coming in saying, we're going to hook you up to an IV. We're going to give you medicine. I said, no, no, no. I don't want that. And that nurse looked at me. And she said, 
I guess you like pain, huh? And I'm like, what the heck? My first time mom, 24 years old, young thing, I'm trying to do the best for my baby by not doing stuff to it that I think is unhealthy. I'm willing to, I am willing to put up with the pain and you're sitting there mocking me. Things did not go well up to that. So anyway, I'm not going to go the whole thing. But anyway, a certain point came and they came, they came in and said, I had to get a C-section. And I said, why? I said, you're not progressing enough. And I told them to get out of my room and they went and they left the room. And 15 minutes later, I punched, you know, elbowed my husband. I said, you can ask them to come back in because I'm having the baby now. And then they, he went out, got the nurse. She came back in and goes, when are you? Oh, you think you're having the- Oh, you are. Doctor rolls in. I had the baby. Okay. Natural birth. But I fought for it. And I did not like the way I was treated. All right. So next child comes along. And that would be over on the right. That's my son, David. All right. My son on the other side, Jeremy, was adopted when he was five years old. But the other birth I had was son David on the right. So I decided to have home birth because I didn't want to go back to the hospital. Uh, I did have the home birth. I was what you call unattended. I had people there who had knowledge of things, but they weren't, they weren't certified. And my son was born. Best birth ever. <laughs> it was great. And he was healthy, super healthy, uh, nursing well. Everything was great. Three weeks, three weeks go by, and suddenly he's nursing it. He's he's refusing to nurse, and his head is going back, and it's going stiff. And I'm like, oh my god, isn't that a sign of meningitis? So now I was so so I did my research, and I'm like, okay, most of the time meningitis is viral, which means there is no treatment for it. It just you just it just go you know the child has to live through it. But there's a tiny chance that it's bacterial, much, much smaller. I forgot what the percentage is, but very small chance it's bacterial. In that case, he needs to get antibiotics in order to save his life. And I'm looking at my little baby and I'm going, I'm not fond of the, the medical system. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't a person who hardly ever went. And by the way, I haven't had a, I think I an exam since 1990. So I'm that person. Okay. <laughs> I'm going for yearly checkups and all that crap. So. Don't, don't go there and just give me all the grief now. All right. But that's me. I'm not a big medical person, although I worked in the medical system. So anyway, I'm looking at the baby. I'm going, what do I do? And I'm like, I, as a parent, I don't think I can take the chance on even that tiny bit of it being bacterial meningitis. I must save his life. I can't, can't put my own feelings in this. I went to Children's Hospital, Washington, D.C. I believe that's where it was. And... I arrived there and they look at him and go, yeah, he's got meningitis. And they say, we're going to start him immediately on antibiotics. I'm happy. Then they come in and say, but we need to do a, a spinal tap. It's a three week old baby. I'm like, what the heck do you need to do that for? They go to see if it's bacterial or viral. I said, wait a minute. You're already giving them antibiotics. So if it's, if it's bacterial, the antibiotics will, will, will take care of it. If it's not bacterial, you're giving them the medicine anyway, so it doesn't matter. So what's the point of the spinal tap? Oh, we need to know. I said, no, you don't need to know. I don't even need to know. Is this for your records? Because you're giving an invasive procedure to a three-week-old baby that serves no real purpose. At that point, they came in and threatened to take the baby away from me to go to the judge and have my custody removed so they could do the spinal tap and other things. So yeah, I've been in that situation and I did not know what to do because, you know, it, you're, you're in such stress. You just don't understand. You don't know what the system can do to you, your child. And they also sent the social workers in, by the way. So they asked me, what do you think they asked me? Where's the baby born? Home. And who was the attending physician or midwife? None. That doesn't go over well because I am outside the system's methodology of thinking this was not good <laughs> on top of that we had a family bed four of us slept together i mean we had a bed for my daughter in the other room but she didn't like, spend much time in it <laughs> she was two now and she's like ah, i'm not going there yet we never had a crib i never had a crib for a kid I, I, I'm, and i you know there's people who disagree they always feel you're going to roll over and kill the baby in the night that's only usually if you're drunk or something and i nursed my children and I loved it. They were right there with me. I, 
I felt it was safer for them because I felt isolation was not a normal thing. And most of the world, isolation is not a normal thing to put a baby in another room, shut the door, um, leave the baby alone in the crib. That's just my personal opinion. So I didn't have a crib. I didn't have a nursery. You know? And I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to send people out to my house now. And now they're going to charge me with God knows what. So I started calling friends going, if I need you, can you run over with a crib? And, you know, but make a nursery really quick. This is the things you have to do. So, but I was like, what do I do? They're already looking at me suspiciously now. So I did give permission for the spinal tap. I caved. And then they screwed it up and did two. Yeah. And guess what? It was viral. After all. And then, then they were still being obnoxious and they sent people over to talk to me, the social worker. And finally, the social worker said, I don't have a problem with you, which I was thrilled. I ended up with a good social worker. I signed out against doctor's orders because my child was fine. What was the point of him staying there any longer? And I, you know, I, I didn't have any insurance. So, I mean, they're like, you're going to keep him for two more days and charge me. So I, I said, I'm, I'm in the room with him anyway. And you're, he's out of danger. So what's the point? So, so I left. It wasn't a good experience. <laughs> it was not. And just to throw a little further thing on the system, um, I homeschooled all my children. And what happens there is the, the, in, the, in the time that we were in, uh, which is in the 80s, that public school system would send out people to your house once a year to determine whether your children were being properly educated, which was kind of a joke because it's like the reason we don't have them in public school in our area is because y'all suck. So <laughs> now we have them at home. But they weren't concerned about the kids' education. They were concerned about social issues, that we were keeping our children, like their idea was there were a lot of either Christians or white people who didn't want their children to mix with other religions and other races. So they came out to my house, right? <laughs> Walked in the door. And my, 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 my meetings were like 10 minutes long. <laughs> They all looked at the kids and went, okay, never mind. They're, they're not white. <laughs> and, and they'd leave. They didn't care whether the kids could read or write. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> we got approved every year because of my kids being not white. But then I had friends who I had some friends who were white and they had white kids. And so when they heard their, the school people were coming, they called and said, hey, can you bring your kids over? So then I bring my kids over to their house. And when the school people arrived, their children were playing with children of color. And then they got a short interview. <laughs> and I had like two or three different friends call me up for this. And by the third one, I'm wondering, does a social worker recognize that the school people recognize the same three kids are sitting in each one of these people's houses? <laughs> it was pretty funny. But that's how we had to outwit the system. So I've had my experiences with the hospital. I've had my experiences with the social services. And I also adopted my son, went through the social system there, so the foster, uh, foster care and adoption system. Also the foster daughter and had a horrible experience with the foster system where they basically made ridiculous things and took my child, my foster daughter away, put her in a worse situation because she was in a great situation with me because she was deaf and I could sign. They removed her and put her with a non-signing family. It was ridiculous, but it was all because I wouldn't go along with allowing her to see her baby daddy's father, a baby daddy in prison. She was 13 years old and pregnant by a 30 year old man. I said she should not be going to prison to visit this man. And they removed her from my custody. So do I have warm and cozy feelings toward all hospitals, medical staff, social, social workers? No, I do not. Um, but yet I've worked in the hospitals as well. So I've seen the other side of it too. And this is why I wanted to tell you this to begin with. So I'm coming from both sides. I have sympathies to some extent with both sides. I do think the medical system is outrageous these days. They're controlled by large corporations and, and the, even the doctors and people working in there are controlled by those corporations. It's a simple fact. Um, I, and when I was interpreting, there were times when my, my client would ask, for example, do I need this medication? And they would actually say things like, Kaiser Permanente says, blah, blah, blah. and the, the patient would go, I, I don't want to care what Kaiser Permanente says. What do you say? And, and the doctors squirm in because they don't know what to say because they can't go against the organization they work for. And they're supposed to be promoting things like hormones or whatever the hell they're promoting. Um, it, it's really, really difficult. It's hard for anybody to come in who's a strong person. I just went in for an eye exam 
and I went to one place and they pissed me off right away because they want to ask me a ton of questions I wasn't intending to answer. I'm like, I want you just to do the eye check without any kind of prior knowledge of anything because I think it's very scientific and I don't want you to be influenced by anything I said. I just want you to look and then we'll talk. I had to walk out. I got another appointment and I was shocked to get a, an eye doctor. It was fabulous. And they, they let me do exactly that. I answered no questions before the exam. He did the examination. He showed me all the photos. We talked and then I explained everything. I was thrilled. But that is not my usual experience <laughs> where you get respected as, as a patient or as a parent of a child. So once you walk into the hospital, you lose a lot of in a, even a doctor's office, you lose a lot of your own agency. You're putting, you, it's like, that's why I don't like the word patient. It's like, you come out, oh, who's your doctor? You, you're his patient. I'm not his patient. You know, I don't belong to him. He doesn't own me. And I have the right to decide what I want without somebody saying, you need, the, you have to have this, you have to have this, you have to have this. And if I object, they get all surly, you know. Um, but it's, it, 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 the problem is that we lose agency when you walk in, you go to a hospital, you immediately get the stupid little gown on and you start getting treated as she was called ketamine girl. And then that happens, you know? Um, <laughs> so it's a problem with the hospitals. And I will stand by this. We have the same problem with police departments. The method of communication is not very good. And a lot of times reasons that the police departments and, and, and families get into these conflicts is because of the condescending attitude toward the family um, and the person. It's like they're up here and this person is down here and we control and you don't. And that leads to a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger uh, and a lot of behavior that may not be. Um, you know, when you have con people condescend to you, I had Verizon condescend to me the other day trying to fix my uh, Internet. I. I said some terrible things because <laughs> I don't like being condescended to. Don't talk, call me stupid. Oh, did you do that? Yeah, I'm not an idiot. It's, the problem is your your company is providing poor service. <laughs> but the way if you talk to me like this, well, ma'am, ma'am, I'm trying to tell you, and I'm I'm trying to talk to you, ma'am, and you just keep talking over me. I know I'm trying to speak, ma'am. You all heard that before. Whew, it's very frustrating and to be condescended to. Um, now, mind you, on the other side, having seen patients and people talking to the police, sometimes they're difficult to deal with. All right. So you have the other side who is exhausted trying to deal with many people. And you've got this person who is <sighs> difficult. And this is one of the issues with Beata is that the staff immediately found her very difficult to deal with. But I don't know what their behavior was. I don't know if they were condescending to her and it put her off, you know, set her down into some mode. But we'll get to some of the actual evidentiary issues of this whole case. But that's my whole speech on where I'm coming from so you understand that. And now, you know, I'm going to look at some of your comments and I'm going to go into the, the uh, case. Um, um, uh, I want to point this out. Um, no reason to deny her a hug. This is an interesting problem. Uh, one of the questions here was, why wasn't she given supervised visits? Uh, and I don't have an answer to that. I think it was as because we haven't we've all, from from the uh, movie uh, uh, Take Care of Maya, we only see one hundred percent the family side. Now, mind you, this came out before before the the uh, court case. And is highly influential to a jury in the court case. Who probably everybody on that jury has seen that 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 movie, even if they're going to lie about. It. Highly influential. And and some one of the things they said during the show was, well, the police refused. I mean, I'm sorry, the hospital refused to participate. And a lot of people took that as, well, you know, if they're not willing to stand up, they're not willing to speak. Well, first of all, they're in the middle of a lawsuit; they can't. Secondly, having done this myself. I'm very skeptical of documentaries who are going to do long interviews with me and then they're going to take everything out of context, edit me and make me look like a, a horrible idiot or something. So they have, if they know that the documentary is pro the family, they're not going to touch that documentary because they'd be idiots to do that. Even if, even if it wasn't about a lawsuit, they'd be idiots to do that. But could there have been, and I, do, I say, I don't know the whole situation, 
cer certain kinds of supervised visits that would work. I don't know what their rationale was in that situation. Why? Because in a lot of situations where somebody else has custody of your kids in a foster care situation, for example, people have certain rights to see the, the person you're caring for as a foster child. Um, my foster child had an aunt um, that she had grown up. They had taken her away from the aunt, mind you. But we, we there was an agreement, and I drove her down to see the aunt and spent so she could see the aunt, spent time with her, um, supervised, mind you, because otherwise she'd be riding on the back of a motorcycle, the guy 30 years old. <clears throat> and mm, Auntie wasn't exactly a very good guardian, but I was okay with driving there, which is about two and a half hours away and having her spend the day, visit, go to lunch, whatever. Could they have done something better? I don't know because I don't wasn't there to see what the reasoning was, but one would think that was a possibility. Um, <laughs> why, why is that, Michaela? Um, I'm good. I'm good. I love you guys. <laughs> uh, except, for, except for Verizon. I don't like Verizon. But um, let's see. Um, yes, he was crying his heart out in the courtroom. And one of the things, again, we have to watch out for, and this is where the jury system comes into pro being problematic, and the, and the movie, too. You, you, everybody is crying. This was very traumatic. No matter who was right or wrong or whether it was a combo of both, this, effect, this was a very, very sad thing for the family and for the kids. It was dreadful. The question is, whose fault is it? Was it the mother's fault for leaving her family and leaving her children? Or was it the hospital's fault for driving the mother to make that decision? And that's where it all comes down to. And what some, some, so many interesting issues in that. Um, no, it's, it's not terminal. It's, it's permanent. <laughs> terminal is different. I, I'm sorry. Sorry. I don't understand where you come to terminal. It's not a terminal diagnosis. You have it forever, but it's not terminating your life. ALS is terminal because there's no, you don't, you, 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 you know, you usually have three to five years on that if you're lucky. Some people get 10, but it's very rare, but you, that's terminal. There's no, there's no way to fix it. You go downhill. Uh, CRPS is a, maybe may a lifetime a diagnosis. And I know you have experience with this, but I believe it's a lifetime diagnosis, not terminal. Um, let's say, um, Let's see, da, 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 da. let's see what we have here. Um, I'm trying to sift through here. Um, I think Munchausen syndrome is more common than anyone realizes. It, it, it is, and I'll tell you why it is, Beth, and, and this is an interesting point. And it comes in degrees. Now, everything is not, you know, it's like, uh, let's say you got a male psychopath. Does that mean he's a serial killer? No, there, there's, they're not necessarily serial killers. They could be all kinds of other things, business people, their husbands, you know, they're all kinds of things, you know, sons, <laughs> fathers. Um, they, they, they work in all kinds of fields. Their psychopathy doesn't necessarily mean they commit uh, lethal crimes. It could mean they're just difficult to deal with because they lie a lot and they manipulate and do all the things psychopaths do, but it doesn't mean they kill. Um, some do, but not everybody. So the same thing is true with female psychopaths. Uh, and, you know, this is it, it's a narcissism continuum. So here, here's the thing. It's really, it, you know, when we learn to put people with labels and put them in exact boxes, it, you know, there are too many, too, too many labels, too many boxes. Essentially, it's like this. We all have self-interest. If you didn't have self-interest, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, you have to have self-interest. Like, I need to eat today. I need to have friends. I need to have a good job. I need money. I need a place to live. I need these things. This is self-interest. Now, that's okay. Everybody has to have that. That's a human condition that's necessary for life. Then you go up the, the scale a little bit. Let me go this way. Okay. So we start down here, self-interest. Then you go a little this way and you get into narcissism. Narcissism just means that your self-interest gets a little bit too strong. And that your empathy for other people and their rights goes down all right so if, if you're healthy it's like this you have self-interest but you won't do things to other people have no regard for them and then when you get very narcissistic 
things go like this, where you matter way more than this person matters. And to the point where you, you, you don't have a lot of concern over the, what happens to them. It only matters what happens to you. That's where the narcissism now goes this way. Psychopathy is kind of just the end of the narcissist scale. That's all. Uh, where are you on the scale? You know, is there an absolute? I don't think there's an absolute. It's, it's direction. And then, then we have these traits of narcissism, traits of psychopathy that we then say, oh, if you have 10 of these, that's you, which is sort of true, but also not necessarily so. So you have a lot, you have more Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, people realize, but it's much more gray area than people think because we all have levels of wanting to control, uh, to making determinations. Um, it, it's, it's extremely complicated. That's all I can say. I've had people call me a narcissist because I homeschool. You know, and they'll say, well, you know, your children should be out in regular schools, public schools, where they can learn about society, blah, blah, blah. And you want to control those kids. You want to, you want to determine exactly what happens to them. You're such a narcissist that you, 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 you don't want those kids to be dealt with by anybody else in society. You want control of them 24 hours a day. Well, how true is that? <laughs> did I want more control than some people over my children's lives? Yes, I did. Was it because it was something I felt I needed to do because our school system was pretty crappy and I couldn't stand to watch what I would see and that kids go downhill in it and not, you know, get what they needed and all kinds of stuff that just, I found horrifying um, in our, in our area, not everybody's area, but in our area, it was true. Um, or was it, did I keep my kids home to fill, fulfill my own needs because I didn't want anybody else to be interfering with me. I wanted to control everything. Is that why I did it? Who knows? You know what I'm saying? I, I, I can't prove it. It's just your opinion or my opinion and that person's opinion. You know? so, and it becomes a cultural thing sometimes. Like, somebody, oh, my God, you're so selfish to have your kids in bed with you because you could have killed them. Okay, so I'm selfish. Now, now, I'm a, now I'm a psychopath. You know? Or other people say, well, I saw, oh, that is so wonderful. You're a great mom. You nursed your babies. You kept them close. You loved them so much. Which one is it? Depends which side. Same thing happened with Beata. And this is why I have to look very carefully at what Beata's thinking is and what her behaviors were to actually even have a determination of that. And it gets very tricky. All right. So <laughs> Pat thinks everyone is a psycho. No, only 80% of you here are. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, let me see what, what, what else we have to say here before I go on to the, the, the issues of when she arrived, what happened before the hospital and what happened after the hospital. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'll just point this out because I think that's a reasonable thing to say, uh, 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 point uh, just on, on police. Th there is a truth to that. Uh, police are scary and they're scary because they have power and they have guns and they are taught to have a level of toughness and, and they probably came in with it because my daughter is a police officer and a police detective. Um, she's a lot tougher than me. <laughs> I can't, I, that's why I never became a police officer. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> but she, she's a great person. She's wonderful, sweet, all these things, but she's also very tough and you have to be on that job. But sometimes the problem is when you're dealing with people, can you, I've seen her change her voice, which is kind of cool. She, when she's talking to like, like citizens and, and parents of, Something happened. She's worked in all kinds. She's worked on homicide. She's worked in sex, uh, sex crime. She's worked in child abuse, domestic abuse. So she's really good at interviewing. Uh, it's quite spectacular at that. And she will change her voice, the sweetest thing you've ever heard. And I'm like, you never talked to me that way. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, but, oh, suspicions. Uh, well, see, okay, well, I saw suspicions go by, and I want to point that out. Uh, well, again, this is, I have to disagree a little bit, Sarah, uh, about systematically tearing her apart for suspicions. This is where it gets really tricky. And I ha I'm going to show a thing from Dr. Grande because I think he pointed something out quite well um, in his uh, 
deter, his discussion, his 50 minute discussion. I'll, I'll link I'll link him too so you all can see that. But I do have some of his his commentary on it. So the, let me let me go back and just say this. All right. So there there were some reasons to be suspicious. So when a, when a child comes into the hospital in horrific condition uh, and a parent claims certain things that cannot be easily diagnosed, you, and of course she could say my other doctor's diagnosis, this is true. Um, does that, if somebody else diagnoses a child, does that mean the hospital staff and medical doctors do exactly what that other doctor says? That would be, you can't do that because in your own if you're going to do things yourself, you can't just accept something somebody else says. Somebody else says, oh, that doctor said that person needed this surgery. You just don't roll them into surgery and cut them open because that doctor said that. You have to work through it so that when you do the surgery, you are confident that you're doing the correct thing. So if somebody says, give her ketamine, a ton, this really super high doses of ketamine, something that was not a normal approved thing in the United States, they're asking Immediately, she came in, immediately asked the doctors to give her these levels of ketamine for, for something they had not diagnosed that is not actually very diagnosable. And then she wanted to give a child huge levels, of very high levels of ketamine to kill the pain. These doctors would be remiss if they just said, oh, sure, okay, whatever. So you can have a quack doctor out there in a heartbeat. And I think her, the doctor she did get was very concerning. So, and I'll say, say, I'll show you why I think she ended up with that doctor who recommended these horrible ketamine treatments. And now, now ketamine, I'll take this back. Ketamine can be useful, especially in this syndrome. It can be useful. Uh, and maybe one of the things that works, but the question is, how do you, how much do you give? And do you do anything else before you give it? In other words, did you use other treatments? And this became your last resort. This is one of the biggest issues in this case. So let me read to you what Dr. Grande said. I'm going, to, I'm going to slide over to what he said because he gives a very interesting description. Uh, let's see where I put it. i got to find it. And I think that's it here. Okay. This is his description, I think. Yeah, okay. 90% of individuals who have factitious, or we're talking about does she, could she have Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Now, mind you, she was highly aggressive she said to, told the doctor she wanted the treatment that she wanted that they should go ahead with that they shouldn't do something else they shouldn't so she was very aggressive now is it because she totally believed that this was this was the only treatment for her daughter and she she believed that not not because she had any kind of uh, psychopathy or anything or narcissism just that this is truly what she thought worked for her daughter and she was horrified that they weren't going to do what she thought was best now, mind you, again, this is interesting. I want to point this out. She's a nurse. She's been to nursing school. She knows how hospitals work. She should have been very well aware when she went to the that when her daughter entered the hospital with a condition which is hard to diagnose, and she was going to request high levels of ketamine, that she was going to encounter resistance. She should have known that because she's a nurse. And yet, apparently, the staff found her very, very volatile, very angry, very, like, you better do this type of thing. So they were like, why is she behaving like this? Why is she trying to force our hand before we even get to look into what's going on? So that's what raised those suspicions. Now, are those, any of the things she was doing, were they evidence of Munchausen syndrome by proxy or factitious disorder? All right. Now, let's look at what Dr. Grande said. 90% of the individuals... Who, uh, factitious disorder are the biological mother of the victim. All right. Absolutely. She's a biological mom. The perpetrator tends to present as overly attentive and attached to the victim. Oh my gosh. Is that ever true? She had herself, and I know she's a mother, so shouldn't you be attached? Yes. But overly attached in the sense that you are controlling literally almost everything that's going on. You're always there. You're always talking to, you know, just on top of them. Um, you see that with, it's, it's, it's like an act that's being done to control. Uh, overly attentive. 
overly involved with every single aspect um, and not being able to say, okay, well, go ahead and that, let me see what happens. That kind of thing. Oh, and if you, and she, she took notes during her, her daughter's time. And again, you can look at this two ways. She took like, let's see if I can find them here. Um, where, where are her? She took tons of, she also video, she recorded everything too. Maybe she was that paranoid about the system too, but she had all the tons of notes about the, the drugs that were involved and what, what, what people said and um, that all the things that happened, every single thing that happened, violations of power. She was on top torture chamber. She was calling it inhumane, unethical. She, she was a li literally on top of everything. She had tons of this, this um, notes that she took. Now, is she just documenting because she wants to make sure that nothing goes wrong with her daughter and that she, if anything does go wrong, she has some, I can't say she's wrong in that, but it does show she's very, very obsessed. And apparently throughout, after she was showed symptoms, she became extremely, extremely active and involved. And again, as a mother, I can't say that's wrong. She's just maybe a really great mother, but you see the gray area. All right, let's go back to what other, other things Dr. Grande has to say here. All right, so overly attentive and attached to the victim. All right, uh, may have extensive knowledge of medical terminology and recommend specific drugs or other treatments. And this is an interesting thing. She is a nurse. I can't tell you how many Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy are nurses. It's crazy, but they are involved in this caring industry where they're taking control of people and that's their thing that they are in they have the power you know it's funny because she's upset with the nurses in the hospital and the doctors who are doing exactly what she signed up to do as a nurse now she's an infusion nurse uh she did home care of infusion that meant she went to different people i don't know i can't find out whether she was still doing that when her daughter was ill i can't find that information out so far or whether that was what she did up until something happened with her daughter. I just don't know. I cannot locate the information. But she was infused. So you go from house to house. You're taking care of people who therefore don't have to go to the hospital to get things like pain medication and things through tubes and other stuff like that where she's able to control doing these things. Again, that's, a, that's not an unpopular job for somebody who has this kind of mindset. It also says here, they often refuse to accept a mental health diagnosis for the victim. They want a physical health diagnosis. So one of the things that's happened along the way, of course, is that the question always comes down to syndromes. And this is where you can sometimes get pissed off. Is it physical or is it mental or is it a combination? Now, I'll give you one little story about my own. Um, I was doing interpreting and in the winter, somewhere around December, January, I, sometimes I get like, you know, like a bronchitis thing. But my bronch, this thing, and one doctor gave it a name once, and I forgot what it was. But anyway, I would get it like a lar like a laryngitis, and it would, and if I, I, if I woke up in the morning, I felt I'm like laying in bed going, I feel okay. But if I picked up the phone and started talking, I ran out of air to speak. And then if I walked to the bathroom, I got tired. And so I'm like, oh my god, I've got this bronchitis thing. So I went to the ER. So first time I went, they gave me a. Uh, Ampicillin didn't do a thing. And then I, I went back or went to a doctor somewhere and they, they gave me uh, Zithromax, Azithromycin. Like in a day later, oh, that two day, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, like it was gone. It was like great. But if I didn't take that, what I found out the next time I had, it lasts for like a freaking month. And I was, going, I was interpreting. People, oh, you didn't need to speak. I'm like, yeah, I do. I have to speak for the deaf person. I signed for the doctor, but then I have to my boy. <laughs> You know, it's not good. And I also look sick. So <laughs> nobody wants me to work like that. So the second time it happened, which was a next year, uh, everything was fine. Then next year, I got that same, I got like a cold and it goes straight in here. So I went to, I went to the emergency room. And they, I said, last time I got this, they gave me a Zithromax. Now I'm not asking for narcotics, for God's sakes. I'm asking for antibiotic. I asked for Zithromax. They looked at me and said, oh, you, uh, we think it's an emotional problem. And I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, I'm emotional problem, why? I'm, I'm, 
I'm happy at home. My kids are great. Everything's going fine. I, I love my job. I work at the dang hospital. I work at this hospital. I would like to go to work, but I, you know, I can't, my voice gets, and I, all I need is Zithromax. They refuse to give it to me. They gave me breathing treatment. It didn't work. They gave me something else and it didn't work. And I'm like, what the heck? Uh, and finally, I, I think I actually went to a different hospital and they gave me the Zithromax and, and I was fine. And after that, I've been to India. So I just bought 10 packs of Zithromax and checked them in my safe. And like, if this comes up again, I'm not going back in. Because so they can tell me I have a mental condition, which is solved by Zithromax. <laughs> so this is a problem when you have a syndrome is that they don't know how much is an, an emotional thing, how much is a true physical thing, or whether it's a combination of both. Another thing to look at is she may well have exactly what she was diagnosed with, but doesn't mean that the mother isn't adding to it. And that's another version of when she hasn't sent by proxy. It's like, oh, goody, I've got a sick kid. They like having a sick kid. It's different than, oh, my God, I have a sick kid. I got a cure. It's I have a sick kid. I can be involved. I can do things. Now. I can go to doctors. And she went to supposedly over 30 of them. That's what I call doctor shopping. Now, she supposedly was looking for a diagnosis. But was she? Or was she looking for the guy who gave ketamine? I don't know. But sometimes Munchausen cinema proxy isn't saying that the person doesn't actually have a condition, but they worsen that condition by exaggerating certain things or causing certain things to happen. Like another question that one might have, she works, she works with infusions. She works in home care. Did every single drug get to every single person she was giving it to? Or did some of them come home? I don't know. I don't know if she was actually working in home care when her daughter was you know, during the sick process. But this, I'm just pointing these out. These are things that those suspicion things, I have them. I'm like, okay, she's a nurse. She was overly aggressive toward the nurses and doctors when she should have understood the system. She could have backed up and let them have some time to diagnose. She, even if she had been in pain, she'd been in pain before. It didn't kill her. She was just in pain. So give the doctors a few days to do, say, hey, you check it out, whatever. But she didn't. She immediately went in there and started doing the stuff that put everybody on edge and made them think she was trying to control some situation by giving her daughter excessive amounts of ketamine. Um, and not considering anything else. So that's problematic. Um, and say she could have had exactly what she has, but she chose to take a, a specific route by finding the right doctor to do the thing she wanted. Now, mind you, after that, she got to the doctor who gave the ketamine. She then, they, then she went and did that experimental treatment in Mexico, where she went down, they put her, they put her child in a ketamine coma. I think it was five days or something. And the idea is to let the body rest and then whatever, but it has a high chance of death. I would think you would do everything before you'd ever take that chance. But she didn't. She rolled down to Mexico, did that. She also went back to Mexico to get these boosters. And over a year, it was only like a year from the time she started having the problems to the time she got to the hospital, that she was in a rush to do certain things that probably didn't need to be rushed. Um, but she was obsessed with the ketamine. And she's also an infusion person, which makes me wonder. She's a person who, a nurse who gives drugs. That's her job, literally to give drugs. And now she's got a daughter and she's focused on this. I'm gonna show you something that says, this is not the way it's supposed to go. And the, oh, I'll show it to you right now. Cause this is this, this I just found fascinating. Um, she did tremendous research, supposedly. It went to 30 doctors at least. All right, I did some research. It was last night. Um, <laughs> I found this article in 10 minutes um, and I'm not a nurse and I found this article and this was done. This was from, this is from the National Library of Medicine, Pediatric Rheumatology. This was from 2016, Pediatric Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, a review from 2016. Now this means this, this, uh, there was, it was a whole, uh, study done. And I'm going to say that this was probably a study that wasn't done in 2016. It was probably prior to that, 2015, 2014. In other words, information, when her daughter came down with these things and she was researching, and she was on the internet, she was researching everything she could find about this. And why didn't she see something like this? Now look, look what this says. In general, pediatric CRPS patients have a more favorable outcome than adults. 
Hmm, interesting. Many will have spontaneous resolution after a few months. That's fascinating. Uh, they say that approach uh, the multiple multidisciplinary team approach. Co uh, co I'm not sure what that means. Combing PT and or is that supposed to be combining? And CBT will lead to remission in most children. However, relapses are common. In a study done, look at this. They treated these children, they treated uh, uh, with exercise therapy. Exercise therapy, 103 children, 92% improved in six to eight months following an intense exercise program. 49 children continued to follow for a mean of five years. 88% of them were completely symptom free. And 31% had a relapse of symptoms during the duration of the follow-up, which resolved with reinstitution of an exercise program. The median uh, time of recurrence was two months, with almost 80% of the recurrences occurring during the first six months after treatment completion. In a retrospective review of 32 children with CRPS, treated with intensive inpatient, inpatient physical and occupational therapy in conjunction with psychological therapy, 89% had actually had full resolution, 89%. I found that. So what the, one of the things the hospital offered Be Beata was we want to move her to a facility that can do better than we can do here. Intensive, we wanted her to get intensive physical therapy along with occupational therapy, along with psychological stuff. She refused. And in all those 30 doctors, she, she worked up to getting Mr. Ketamine doctor. How much physical therapy, psychological stuff, all this stuff, did her did she have her daughter involved in? I don't find evidence of that, that she put her in a, before she hit, hit her up with ketamine and took her and put her in a coma, that she did what this study says most kids with this do best if they get this intensive treatment, which is non-invasive. Now, if I got a little girl who's nine years old and she's in pain and there's a way to treat that non-invasively, I'm going to go there first before I start chucking a whole bunch of medicine in her and putting her in a coma, which would cause her death. That's why the doctors were suspicious. They saw these signs that concerned them, that she refused to allow them to spend any time getting diagnosed, to put her in a facility that would do these things, that all she wanted was ketamine, 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 ketamine. That was their problem with her. And so they questioned that she was, they were concerned that she didn't have the best interest of her child at heart. So that's why they asked for that separation. And in that time, the idea was, well, if she's not there to push ketamine on her, we want to see if she can get better. Now, of course, they didn't have the things they needed to do that, the, the very, very uh, uh, big program of uh, physical therapy and all that. They had some, but not to the level that the doctors, the hospital wanted to move her to a place that she could get that. Even as an outpatient, they were willing to do that. But it didn't happen. Now, here's something interesting to note. Uh, after the, uh, the death of the mother, which is another interesting point, and as far as what kind of psychology she had, she, if, if you watch the movie, she's over and over, she's telling her daughter, she is saying to her, be strong, be strong, be strong, hang in there, be strong. Um, and so here she is in the hospital, be strong, be strong. Um, that's what she's telling her. And in, in, nine, in less than 90 days, 90 days, she did, did, they were going to review everything. Just a few days before that, she says, I can't do it anymore. The mom says, I can't do it anymore. Mom, you're not in pain. Your daughter's the one that's having difficulty. You're supposed to be there for your daughter, fighting for her. And yes, it's true that you had to take a back seat. But why aren't you still fighting? Why aren't you willing to be around to fight for her? And what about your other son? And what, what emotional toll do you think it's going to take on your children to take yourself out of the picture? How do you think that's helping your kids? Or is it the problem you lost power? You lost the ability to control to the extent that you enjoy controlling. That is another sign of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is what I think they're going to point, probably point out in court. Um, do I think she had some kind of condition, which, which was the condition she was diagnosed with? I think it's very likely she did have that condition. 
Do I think she took the proper treatment route for her? No, I do not. I think she went, she was an infusion person. She liked the control of giving medicine. That was a thing for her, it seems to be. So I think that's problematic. Now let's look what happened after she, after, after she was no longer in the picture, she was allowed to go home, all right? And to her father's care. And her father, by the way, so some of the other interesting things before I go into what happened after she got home, let me point out a couple things that they that are said to be true that uh, are interesting. A several doctors person observed Mrs. Kowalski was aggressively hostile to her providers who disagree with her screaming and demanding that Maya be placed in a medically induced coma and having a pump implanted into her spine. Beata once stated Maya was in so much pain she wants to go to heaven. Doctors observed Maya acted inconsistent with her and her mother's claims of severe pain and disability, including standing up in bed and sitting Indian style. Uh, so they, they, they saw she had some pain and some problems, but they didn't see it to the level that the mother was claiming. Um, the girl told the nurse she was tired of these lies. I don't know how accurate any of this is. And they said she was severely underweight when she had arrived, hadn't eaten, uh, and now they're feeding her. Now, the, 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 process, the, the, the family lawyers are claiming that she lost weight in the hospital, and the, the doctors, I think, are claiming she gained weight. So I don't know it's true there. But listen to this also. All right. Uh, apparently, they were not the only hospital that suspected there was medical abuse. There were other people that had also been flagged before in another hospital. Most disturbingly is that Jack Kowalski admitted to the police investigator that he witnessed the same concerning behavior from his wife that the medical professionals uh, witnessed. When he was with Maya, Maya had no complaints of pain. And when Maya's mother got home, Maya would suddenly be in pain. Also said that uh, he wouldn't, Jack was willing to say that Beata, Beata let, uh, if that Beata leave the house, if it meant her daughter could, his daughter could return home. Um, he said that he thought there was a psychological component to his daughter's condition. Uh, and so there's other, this is a, is a lot more here than people realize, but okay. So they let, she was no longer in the picture. They, they let her go home to her, her dad and do outpatient care now. Um, and so this is, uh, where's, where's the picture here? Um, this is her uh, funeral. She's in the wheelchair. She's just come home. Okay. Now, the, when she was sent home, let me see if I can find the right thing here. Oh, let me find the right thing. It's down here somewhere. <laughs> okay. Is it there? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Uh, it was also claimed. Here's another thing that was just claimed. Um, there is a claim that she had written fraudulent prescriptions and faced c c criminal charges. And that's one reason she might have this issue. Now the defense team says, I mean, the, uh, Families, uh, lawyers say that's a, a lie from the hospitals, and I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but let me go to, I want to go to what they sent her home with. Um, hold on a second. I got to figure out where it is on this, this little teeny thing. Where did it go? Hold on a second. Uh, hold on. I got to find it. Um, because this this is the regimen they sent her home on, and this is important to understand. Um where is it? Hold on a second. Where did it go? Nothing. Where is it? Ah, here we go. Where did I put it though? Where, where, where? Where did I put it? Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Where is Maya Kowalski now? As of this article, she's 17 years old and takes part in Duke University's talent identification program for gifted children. She still has CPRS, but the courts ordered her family not to undergo ketamine treatment anymore. A year after she left the hospital, she took her first steps unassisted. She said, I still have pain, but it's not as severe as it once was, and I'm forever grateful for that. And here she is today. She's skating there because as the article I read to you about the study, 
most of the children who get this, not necessarily the adults, the children who get this, most of it resolves over time. And they, with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and some psychological support, most of the children do not have severe symptoms of this later in life. It disappears altogether, or they have it in a milder form. She never, she never took ketamine again. And look at how healthy she looks. Did she really need to have massive amounts of ketamine and be put into ketamine comas when she could have these other methodologies? And what bothers me is she didn't seem to care about those other methodologies. She only wanted ketamine. Um, I find that highly suspicious. If I were in the hospital and a doctor, a nurse, seeing what was going on, I might have done the same thing. I Now, having said that, was there a better way to do this and not have the system be so brutal? Perhaps, because I've seen that, that brutality thing where they come up with, oh, well, we, have a, we have a plan and you better agree to the plan. If you don't agree to the plan, you lose custody. That's what they did with me. You don't agree to the plan to give this your son this? Well, take custody from me and get the judge to order. It didn't make me like them. Uh, but what was why, why they... My, I believe my, my opinion on that, uh, the, the, the spinal tap on my son was perfectly legitimate. They wanted to do it their way, and it was harmful to my son, but I lost power in that instance. Now, that can be the same thing that happened here. You know, here you've got a child who's been under care with somebody who I think is a, mostly a quack, in my opinion, because he didn't seem to think she should do any of these other things first. I think he was just one of those drug dealing doctors who just, that's the way he did his thing. And she liked, it. but what concerns me is for all the research she does in the knowledge of nursing, she didn't seem to want to go a more, a less invasive route for her daughter. Um, and the invasive, and, it, and it was proven once she was no longer in her mom's care, she improved and became quite a healthy human being. So the ketamine was not probably the appropriate thing at that point in her care but why was she so insistent about it and i uh, and again i don't know whether she had this condition and she just gave one of that ketamine for whatever reasons or she had this condition and she helped worsen the condition through psychological stuff through attention that's what the husband said it seemed like when she rolled in she had more pain stuff like that whether she could even have done something with something she got from work that would cause certain symptoms I don't know. And she's dead now. We'll never know. But I will, I say the one thing that stands out to me most is that she wouldn't go for a less invasive treatment first, which was recommended and proven by study. And I found it last night in 15 minutes. And she's a nurse and did massive research for her own daughter and didn't make that choice. Went straight to putting her in a coma, which would have, could have killed her, took her out of the country to do that. I'm, I, I have to lean on the side of she had serious problems. And also the fact that she she was about to end this 30, this 90 day thing was just about to end in a few days. And she takes herself out of the picture. Why? Why wouldn't you say, good, it's, it's ending. Maybe I can get something done now. Instead, she runs away permanently, inflicting massive pain to her children, her family, all because she didn't like being called a criminal. If your daughter has a disease which causes her agonizing pain and she has to go be put in a bloody coma on your okay, you can't you can't deal with being called a criminal a little bit. And 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 understanding that you're fighting you're fighting the system. I get it. I fought the system many times, but I was there for my kids. And you decided that's a 90 days to take yourself out. That's a sign that you have some kind of emotional problems. You have some kind of psychological problems. That kind of seals that one. Now, what kind? You can argue over the what kind, but I'm going to say I lean on the side of the hospital was probably correct in their belief. Were they? Did they handle it well? I don't know. It wasn't there. I don't know how rude they were, how bullying they were. I didn't know if they had other options that were better uh, for for dealing with this whole thing. Because I say I'm, I'm not fond of a lot of the condescending crap and the power power trip that they can put over on you. I'm not fond of that. So I'm, I, I think the hospital may be that monster institution and corporation that 
takes it, it ends up being um, a power a, such a powerful control it's frightening and when they collude with the government it gets even more frightening so uh, that's a whole that's a whole big issue uh, it is but the, the issue here is did is a is the hospital responsible for what happened for her choice did they make the wrong choice with her and I and my answer to that is they 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 were correct that she didn't she needed to be off the ketamine and she she did well after she was off of it getting the proper getting the proper treatment the hospital was actually correct in that and they were probably correct in that she's likely to be munchausen in my proxy and the the third the 90 days i don't know whether they handled that well i don't know that might be something the whole trial brings out but so I, I don't necessarily have massive sympathy for the hospital to be in this position, but I don't know if they are entirely wrong either. So that's kind of where I stand on this. Um, but do I think she probably a much has a cinema proxy and the answer to that is yes, I do. Um, but I also think she, Maya really had what she has. Um, but I just think she exploited it in a way that is kind of common to people with that problem. She'll come across looking like the most caring, loving person and be all over this like she's like, you know, mama bear. But there's something kind of amiss in this whole thing, which just isn't right. Um, and that's probably because she has that as well, you know, the Munchausen thing as well. And the problem the doctors have is both of these things are very difficult to deal with because the proof is not there in scientific form. You know, you can't see it you have to evaluate and determine and it's it's very difficult both these though both the issues are difficult for both conditions um and then we go back to doc, dr Grande. i thought was interesting he basically says he understands why the hospital did what they did and they said well when they, they found out they were wrong about her and her condition they should have like done something different i'm like that's not exactly taking her out of munchausen syndrome by proxy just because she does have a condition that's not it because again sometimes that's what you use and get very excited about. Um, but I talked in another video about a, a, a girl that, um, a woman that wanted a C-section early and managed to get it. So her child was born blind and, and uh, uh, completely messed up. She would, the poor little baby went off to the hospital for sick children and died a year later. And that woman who is much as in my proxy, very, very absolutely loved that whole year because she went to the hospital all the time and got everybody to fawn over her and pat her on the back and say, oh, look at you, such a wonderful mom, you're coming to visit the baby. She didn't have to take care of that baby. She just, she liked watching the sea. She wanted to insert herself so she would get all the attention and all the sympathy. She was thrilled about that. No, she didn't care one bit about the baby. She just cared about the fact she was the mother of that sick little baby and everybody felt bad for her. That's what she did. So. Sometimes that's what, you know, you get a person like this. They like going to the doctors. They like, and if they don't get what they want from that doctor, they go to the next doctor until they get that. And then they control things. And there's a whole thing in there. Um, and when she got to this hospital, that all came to a screeching halt. And that made her very angry, which is also something you see with Munchausen Cinema Proxy. They don't handle losing power and control very well. They get really nasty. And, um, and she... Uh, say nine, less than 90 days later before she's just about to come out of the custody of the hospital she decides not worth not worth waiting for uh, I, I will stand with uh, that uh, not that I love what the, ho the hospital's methodology but I just don't know it all of it I just know that I've had bad experiences uh, with the way people are treated and, and and I think that needs to be improved I think that whole system needs to be improved I think the social service system needs to be improved foster care needs to be improved the hospitals need to be improved and police communication also needs to be improved and our legal system sucks they're like 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 the rate of, they, that that that's that's a whole nother thing i'm not gonna get into that <laughs> so anyway well i don't know where i'm at here now all yeah, right um yeah they say the documenting was not necessarily a proof that you know anything wrong in that um just that she was very very much so the person that did all these things and um I'm trying, i don't think i document i don't think i document anything to tell you the truth when it's happening to me i think i was so shocked and um 
just struggling with, just dealing with, just being with my son and watching him. I didn't have time to do all that. But um, let's see. Um, yeah, well, this is this is a thing. That's going to be a hard thing to prove. Uh, you know, a person makes a decision to no longer be here on uh, on Earth. Um, yeah, it's hard to point to one person unless they actually helped you, literally. Um, it's, it's hard to point to one entity, one situation that would make a person choose that. Um, we, we, ha we have very little history of uh, Beata as far as all the rest of her life. Uh, her, her husband said she was a powerhouse, like real strong and aggressive. He said that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say, as I often say about this, the, the person on the sideline, a person like this, they're adult. I think he may be adult. Just like we have Sherry Papini. Obviously, clearly she was Munchausen syndrome, but her husband's like, oh, no, you know, and then, and then she gets kidnapped and he still thinks she was kidnapped. I think he's adult. I think she, the, the control from a person like this, first of all, they find a person who will accept their control. And then once they're there, they control things. And the other person just sort of goes along with the program because they have the lesser power and they don't want to keep, you know, they have to have trouble fighting that person who's very strong. So they kind of like the dolt, they go along with it. They're not necessarily comfortable with it and all this stuff. And they see, they see problems and all that, but they just don't do anything about it. Um, they let the other person control. Where was the husband when she, where was daddy when she went out down to Mexico to be put in a coma? Did he not say, Hey, this shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing this to her. Why don't we take her to physical therapy? I don't know where he is on that. Now, the problem we have in court now, do so we run to a different problem? They're up, they're trying to win $200 million. And, and there's a bunch of things they want to prove. One is that the family did everything right. Mom did everything right. The father wants his kids to believe that mom is the, a great mom and had their, they, she cared about them. And it was the hospital's fault. All this happened. That's what dad wants them to believe. And also there's a heck of a lot of money. And so by the time you get to court, you get a staged sometimes thing of what happened and how life was. You get, you don't get the truth. And this is, this is always the problem. Uh, you know, what, and we see this sometimes where um, so, something bad happens to somebody and then, and then people say nothing but nice things about them. When the truth is they have drug problems, they were in prostitution, they, they, <laughs> they stole stuff, you know, and all of a sudden, that person's so wonderful because now the person's not with you or something happened to them or they're, they're accused of something. And then you get everybody coming out and say, oh, that person's just wonderful. You know, but is that true? If you look at the BT, uh, Dennis Rader situation and, and Carrie Rader, uh, here, Carrie, I'm sorry, that's not her name now. <laughs> Carrie, his daughter. I forgot her name now. Rawson? What is it? What is it? I just, I just blanked on it. Carrie. Anyway, Rawson. Rawson. Um, she, her book is very interesting because she does go through how everything, you know, dad seems to be a really nice guy and he does all these things for family. But then there's these moments which he's not a nice guy. He's not. He's controlling and he even choked her brother a couple times. He's not a nice guy. But they weren't willing to recognize him and tell people about it. And, you know, so the same thing is happening here. So what we're going to hear in court is going to be a very skewed version of what Beata was actually like. I'm not saying it's not, I can't say if it's right or wrong, but I'm just going to say it's going to be probably not exactly accurate to life. Um, which is I hear, um, can be read two ways. She's very knowledgeable about disease because it's rare and she's a nurse. She's exaggerating controlling the treatment by choosing the most risky treatment. Uh, yeah, but here's Harper. Here's the problem. She was knowledgeable. She wasn't knowledgeable about that disease. She's an infusion therapist. Okay. Infusion nurse. Um, and she, Researched it, found out it was rare, and thought that's what her daughter had. But if I can find there's reasonable treatments to give her and that her chances of recovering from the reasonable treatment after getting the reasonable treatments are really good, why wouldn't my daughter, I want to just take her to the reasonable treatments and then see how they all went over six months before I chose to do dangerous stuff. So that, that but this is, I too, she's exaggerating controlling the treatment by choosing the most risky one. I lean toward two. Because I cannot see why you wouldn't want to do the other one first. 
I just, uh, that makes no sense. It, now, if the other one had a really crappy success rate that she was going to get, you know, the physical therapy and the psycho psychological therapy and all that, well, 10% of the children improve. All right, I might have a different opinion. But if the majority of them improve, and even they even basically say they may just improve on their own without even that, they just that this might be a time thing where it's just after a few years, it just disappears. But clearly, they really believe that these kids could use this stuff, and it really super helps. And even if they do relapse, they just go back into it again. And by the time they're adults, they're in pretty good shape. You know, um, majority of them are doing well. And and if you look at um, if you look at Maya, she didn't do ketamine from nine years old on, and she and she got out of a wheelchair. She's walking. She's skating. She's having a normal life. She says she has some pain, but her some pain obviously is controlled by minor 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 drugs and not ketamine so yeah um uh, i think they did i think they talked to some of the doctors i don't think it's like they didn't I, I at least i believe they did i think the problem was that that doctor is not necessarily correct this is what i pointed out before there's so many quack doctors out there one of the one of the reasons <laughs> i stopped going to doctors a long time ago even though i worked in the industry um was I went in when I, it was 1990. I went into a, a really nice doctor. She was great. Did some, did tests, did some blood tests and the gynecological crap and all that. I was told by the end of that, because I was a vegetarian, she said, the test proved me highly B12 deficient to the point where I needed B12 shots the rest of my life, weekly B12 shots the rest of my life. Two, I needed calcium because my, my bones had their issues there. Three, I needed, uh, a, I needed surgery, pelvic surgery. I did none of those three things. I have never taken B12 in my life, <laughs> not even the pill because I keep forgetting to do it. Uh, I never took calcium, never got the surgery. I'm perfectly fine. And that was 30 years ago. What if I had done all those things? I also was told I had to get gallbladder surgery. I never got gallbladder surgery. I started eating better and didn't eat a bunch of greasy chicken. And I still have my gallbladder. I think of the things that if I had just done what they told me, I would have had those two surgeries and other stuff. God knows. And now I'm not saying all medical, if you go to a doctor, you're not going to be treated well. You may get a great doctor, a very knowledgeable person who, who does things that aren't just, just, just jump. But having worked in the industry, I've, I've seen both. I've seen good doctors who, Hey, hey, let's step back. Let's do these kind of things first. And I've seen other doctors just go like this. Here, take this. And the person is on like hormones the rest of their dang life when they didn't need to be, uh, you know, or, or, or on blood pressure medicine when they didn't need to be. They don't, and on diabetic medicine when they don't even work with nutrition. I mean, it's like, you know, this stuff goes on all the time. It's, it's the, I got, you got seven minutes and here's your, here's your prescription, but, or, I've seen horrible stuff done with uh, mammograms and biopsies for women because just ridiculous reasons why they end up with a biopsy appalling. And so there is this problem <laughs> in the system, which, which exists. And so the question is, which doctor do you believe? And so if, if she's got a quack doctor who chucked her on ketamine and says, that's what she needs. Why should the hospital believe that that's what she needs? Just because that doctor said so. They have to make their own determination. You know, once somebody comes into your care, you can't just take the word of somebody outside. You have to do your own stuff. She knew that. This is what bothers me. She, being a nurse, knows that. She didn't give any time. Now, she had been on, you know, on and off ketamine during the year and all the boosters and all that crap she'd been in. And she'd been getting, I, thought, I can't remember how many infusions she actually ended up with. It was a lot. Um, very high ones, but she knows she's not going to die in the next two to four weeks. She could have stepped back and said, okay, this is what my doctor says. This is what I believe. If I, I'm a nurse. I understand what you have to do. So let me, let me, let, let's work together on this. I want to see what you come up with. She didn't do that. That was the problem. So, you know, I, you know, she, her, her behavior, unfortunately, stood out it really did um um 
she wasn't getting the answers she wanted. And this is, this is very problematic. Um, now, sometimes you're not listened to, and that's why you get angry. I mean, I, that's why I yelled at Verizon, because I asked them specifically for an answer for something and they refused to give it to me. Then I got angry. <laughs> now, it wasn't, I didn't get the answer I wanted, but I wanted an answer and you didn't, they didn't give me one. Um, but sometimes, yes, people, I've seen people come in and say something very simple like, oh, here's, some, here's a, 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 an example, um, sickle cell. Sickle cell is very, very painful. So this fellow, I'll call him um, John, came to the hospital with sickle cell and he was in extreme pain. They gave him, uh, what did they give him? Dilaudid and then sent him home with um, uh, 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 per Percocets, lots of Percocets. Um, and he came in and he immediately demanded those because he, he was in pain. And he was. But then John had a friend. I'll call him Jack. Then Jack came in in that same pain. And a lot of times he got the Percocets, which is what he sold on the co corner. <laughs> and when he interpret when I interpreted for him, he would be laying there. Oh, I'm in so much pain. And the doctor would say, what's wrong? That was my back. I'm in horrible pain in my back. Oh, I have sickle cell. I have sickle cell. Yeah, he learned that from his friend. You know, he knew all the, the drama to do. And the doctor would then go, okay, well, we're going to give you some of this, and then we'll, we'll give you a prescription. And he, the doctor would walk out of the room, and he'd just jump right up and go, hey, 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 what's, what's up, Pat? <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> you know, now you're fine? And then as soon as he saw the doctor approach, he'd lay back on, oh. So this is a problem. So at some point, finally, one of the doctors got suspicious and didn't want to give him those drugs because they're like, wait a minute, I think this guy's faking it. I think he's just about getting drugs to sell. And then they confronted him, and he got nasty. Ooh, did he get nasty. He went into a rage, I mean, because he didn't get what he wanted. So the doctors, it's a difficult situation to be in. When you're trying to do a treatment, and you're trying to find out what she's got, and you, you get some doctor says something, and this is what he's done, doesn't mean you you know you can just automatically accept it. Uh, so it's frustrating for the parent who believes that doctor, perhaps, or does she, or does she, I say, does she just like ketamine treatments? I don't know, but it's a tough situation to be in. But she's a nurse. She should understand how the system works because she works in it or she did work in it at some point. Um, <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> if you're overseas, that's the time to get your... Uh, your pharmaceuticals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, So I know, Sarah, you you have you have the same condition. You've gone through a lot. Um, I'm not going to put all that on the screen because I know it's a very long, you know, you're discussing that with people. Um, everybody has, it's no problem. People have different experiences. Um, and her experience apparently now is she did not need the ketamine and she's done well not having it. Um, the problem is, again, was the was the hospital wrong? Was the mother wrong? what was actually going on here. Um, and did the hospital have the right at that point to refuse the ketamine and to get a, a custody so that they could figure out what was wrong with her without the influence of the mother. They believed the mother was influenced. I say that's what, that's what the argument in court is about. But do I see her, I say her ex exhibiting Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Yes, I do. Regardless of whether she had the, what she had, you know, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Pat, did they give a reason for having to know what kind of meningitis it was? Well, that's that, that's what I, I asked. That's what I told him. I said, look, it doesn't matter if 
if you're in a treatment situation as to that. They never said, like, we need to know if it's viral so that we close down the hospital and protect this from getting out. That could be a theoretical. I mean, this is years ago. I don't even remember what I thought back then. But they never told me anything like that. They just said, we, we need to know. Um, and when I said, but he's getting what he already needs, so he doesn't need that spinal tap. I don't remember ever hearing that they were concerned about. They never, they never, they never blocked any. I don't remember anything being blocked off like he was going to, like the viral meningitis was going to go around. I don't remember any of that. That's it's really weird. I don't remember that, but it's been forty years, <laughs> so I don't. But I just remember that if I didn't agree, I, I, they were going to go to the judge, and I thought I was being rational, and they they didn't give me a rational response. I think if. If they had said to me, um, if your son has viral meningitis, we're going to have to, we have to make sure that we let the community know that the meningitis is, is going through the community. I don't even, you know, it's been so long, I forgot what the issue on my viral meningitis is, how, how much, I have to look that up, how much it would be a danger um, to others um, that come in contact. I didn't get any meningitis. Nobody in my house got meningitis. Um, I don't know if somebody, my, one of the students that were staying in my house gave my kid the meningitis. I don't know. Uh, but I don't remember when I even took him out of the hospital against uh, doctor's orders, they didn't keep him there. If, if, he, if he still had that viral meningitis, I don't know when it was would be dangerous to others. I, say, I don't remember any of that, but I don't remember them giving me an answer that made any dang sense. I don't. So... Oh, <laughs> um, I, I approve of him a lot more when he doesn't do a crime scene analysis. I think a lot of his crime scene analysis is off. I still, I still appreciate his humor, but yeah. Um, and, and I don't have a problem with him with the psychological stuff. Some people say, oh, he's, he's not a psychiatrist. No, he's a therapist, but so what? You basically learn the same crap. So I, I just think that kind of stuff is nonsense. But, but I, do, I do get a kick out of him sometimes. I do. But sometimes I think he's completely wrong. But then, you know, sometimes he probably thinks I'm completely wrong. <laughs> so there you go. Um, uh, um, I agree with you, Pat. Uh, she exaggerated the situation, demanded to be in control of the treatment. But Maya and other family members were not in on it or truly hurt by these events. Well, then, you, then the question is, who, who truly was responsible for what happened here? If her mother was Munchausen syndrome by proxy, you cannot blame the hospital for that. So family members got hurt by her. I mean, for example, her children were left without a mother. Did she not do that? Did she not do that to her kids? Her husband was left without a wife. Did she not do that to him? She, she made it about herself. She says, I can't. I can't be, I can't watch her be in pain. I'm okay with, she's got to be in pain, but I can't watch it. Well, she's watched it for a year. She couldn't give it three weeks. That doesn't make sense to me. So she's saying that if her, she kept telling her job, be strong, bear it, bear it all, be strong, be strong, but she can't do three weeks. So, and then she says, it's about me being, being called a criminal. She, it, her choice was about her, not her family. So she is the one who ended up harming her family. That's on her. And the hospital, yeah. Again, do, are, they, are they good at what they do? I don't know. I wasn't there. Supposedly they were trying to get her into the other, other uh, uh, facility to get the treatment she needed. And I, I don't know. I, we'll see. That might be that might play out in court when we go finally get information. It's very hard to get all the information because you don't I only got the defense uh, the. Uh, the family side of it through the movie and only the family side of it through any of the documentation. They make claims. Don't know if the claims are true, but I, I do see what I see. And yeah. So. Uh, and that's true, but I, I have also found that's true for female doctors, to tell you the truth. I, I, I found it 
from both. And I find that, you know, a lot of times when I've gone to a female doctor, I think, oh, good. You know, she's going to she's going to get uh, get me. It's not necessarily true. And let me tell you something that also happens as you get older. They the respect goes down because now you're they treat you like a child that doesn't have any brains. Oh, that poor little old lady, you know, that kind of crap. So that gets really annoying. <laughs> it's 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 I don't like the whole system. I mean, I don't I don't like the way the system's set up. I think it's outrageous. They the it's like they're like um, loan like loan sharks, you know. They come after you and will give you some treatment, but then you have to pay us back twenty times and lose your house. I think that's ridiculous. I think that they do so many treatments and so much uh, 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 different testing purely for the insurance issues and for the money issues. That drives me nuts. I um, mean, it's like, and you put people through a lot of stuff that sometimes causes an injury just because you're making money and in insurance, and you've got to fill in the the insurance form. This whole system is ridiculous. Um, it shouldn't be the way it is. It's, it, you know, and we need to do something about it. But then on the other hand, the other problem we have is that people think that no matter what their situation is, they want incredible services of all these fancy equipment, even if it's not going to help them any. And that costs a fortune. You're, somebody will run up a $2 million bill, one person who wasn't, who quite frankly, wasn't going to make it anyway. Is that okay too? So, you know, it's just such a mess. The medical system has, it's almost like we live in a medical world. You can drive down the street and you've got dialysis <laughs> dialysis centers on every corner, especially in poorer neighborhoods where people that don't have good diets and there's more drug and alcohol problems. Man, there's dialysis things on all, all the corners. It's like, good Lord, there's, there's you know, Popeye's over here and dialysis over here. It's horrifying. And, the, the hospitals are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more massive and more fancy with, you know, remember the little community hospitals we used to have that they don't have them anymore. It's these monsters. Everything is turned into it's a medical monstrosities. Um, and uh, sometimes I just wish it would go back to what it was. I mean, one time I was in Africa and uh, I had like some kind of urinary tract infection. So I walked like seven miles to the town and I went to the, the clinic there and I stood, sat in a line for like four hours. Um, I mean, you know, at least I didn't have a knife stuck in my back or something. People are sitting in line in way worse conditions than me. And I finally get up there. And I, I go in and the doctor is sitting on the side. There's like two, three doctors and three people. We sit in a row. <laughs> well, what's your problem? I think we're in a track infection. He's like, okay. He, goes, he hands me a Coke bottle. Coke bottle, some medicine had been poured into and a little top had been, you know, a rubber banded on. He says, okay, you just drink this. <laughs> I'm like, that's interesting. Work. But anyway, <laughs> no, um, it was kind of like nice because I'm sure today if I went there, I have to pee in the cup and then I, I want to do all kinds of other things. And oh my God. And then that would cost me like, let's say I went to the emergency room with that. I'll probably end up with an $800 bill so I could pee in a cup and they could hand me a, a thing of medicine, you know. We're, we're, it's, 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 just a, it's a monstrosity is what it is. Absolute monstrosity. And you never want to be in it. And sometimes it's hard to avoid getting stuck in it. And people who work in it, some of them are very, very good people, but they're also part of that machine. So it gets tricky. Um, <laughs> Sarah's find Sarah's find a different way to deal with things. I'm not gonna put it on the screen, but uh, I get it. Yeah, you find your way. <laughs> sometimes you have to take matters into your own hands, you know. But you know, then sometimes as an adult, you can do that. You can sign out against doctor's orders as an adult because you have the right to do sort of what you want to do. But when it comes to a child, and you take that child in, you're essentially giving temporary custody to the doctors, just to a great degree, and it's, you know. And they think they know better than you, which in and I've seen some people say, well, you know, people have to start stop. They should be trusting the doctors. The doctors have been to medical school. They know what they're doing. The patients should always trust the doctor. I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> you know? That's not true. That's not true at all. Sorry to say that, but you can't always just trust somebody because they have, a, the, the, you know, they have a degree in something, including myself. Just because I'm a profiler doesn't mean that you shouldn't question and do some of your own research and argue with me if necessary, although not too much, but you know, I see, I've seen too many wrong things be done. 
Um, because there's, if you put the reason for a second opinion is because a lot of times the second opinion doesn't agree with the first opinion. If that's true, how can it be? If you're supposed to trust your doctor implicitly, how can two doctors have two separate opinions? Which one then should you trust implicitly? Same thing we see in the court situation. Oh, the blood spatter pattern, pattern expert comes for the prosecution, for the defense. They're totally opposite. They're both PhDs. They got doctor before their name. Which one is the jury supposed to believe implicitly when they're completely opposite? Somebody's either incompetent or a liar. So there's no implicit belief in anything. We have to be our own best advocates and we do have to be our own best advocates for our children too. But I see her advocacy for her child seems quite off to me. That's where I have my problem. So. Let's see. Uh, you sign forms to give your, your doctor permit. Yes, yeah, so you got to watch out for those forms. <laughs> those suck. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, uh, the family wants to blame someone. I can't accept that the mom is to blame for their pain. Well, there are a number of people that were probably to blame. One could be the doctor who started this went with went along with her program with the um with the the medic that extreme medication of ketamine that's one person one could blame but they don't seem to blame him um they blamed the social worker and and i think somebody else worked at the hospital somehow they they settled out of court on one which i got a lot of money for and then they that well the one that gave that one up and now they're going after the hospital because that's the big bucks um and they didn't settle the hospital didn't settle out of court which i find interesting because but you know, they, the family, I don't know if the family didn't get a the settlement they want. The hospital didn't make the settlement or they think they can get more in court or they really want to bring this to the public's attention. Could be that too. Um, and uh, it's, I think, I think public, the public uh, opinion is weighing heavily toward they think the family should get $200 million. Uh, most people who watched the, the, the film hated, hated the hospital implicitly and, and they, they're, they're, that's where they're like, okay, we totally believe the hospital's bad. And she's totally was just a great mom. And mo uh, most people have gone that direction. Um, and, and, you know, hospital, uh, the, the hospital being the big monster that it is, is hard to sometimes like. Uh, with the administrators and all those other slime bags in there, some of them, sorry, hospital administrators, not you, not you, that one. Okay. <laughs> when I say some of these things, it's, you know, I'm never, never talking about an individual person, an individual doctor, nurse, social worker, da, 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 because I met good ones too. Uh, and I'm not, I mean, I don't think all profilers are great either. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you asked this question. I have, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I try to I try to stay away from legal stuff. Just and I've been accused of, hey, don't talk about legal stuff because you don't know anything. Um, I know some things, but it get it's so complicated. It's so ridiculously complicated. I personally despise most of the legal system. So again, that's another another area which I think is is incredibly awful. Um, and yeah, so big corporations. The insurance companies, the medical medical business, which is to me just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's all gotten out of hand. Where you know, it kind of was nice when you lived on your farm and milked your cow, and you went to your family doctor, who was the one guy, and you gave him some potatoes because you didn't have enough money that week. <laughs> and he he did basic stuff, but he didn't do anything extreme. Now, I guess I I admit maybe maybe certain diseases got you sooner, and maybe you died of things that could have been fixed. But sometimes you just, I just think we live such a medical life these days. I, I, I see it, you know, that people just like live from appointment to appointment to appointment. And a lot of times they don't need to, but they're so encouraged to do so much testing and so much. That's why the, that's why the insurance is so bloody high too, because people are constantly going to the, going to the doctor and getting way more than they need that, that to get. They didn't, don't need all the stuff that is done to them. And I, I guess I've since I, I sat through so many people who've been in the hospital, uh, going to the emergency room, uh, going to doctor's appointments. And I just sit there sometimes and shake my head and think, oh, my God, this is like 90 percent unnecessary. But that's how they make money. That's how they make money. So 
Yeah. Um, so, mm. yeah. Oh, that's probably absolutely true. <laughs> well, when you're talking about the word intensive, again, everything is so unreasonably high these days. Oh my God, I'm sure it is extremely expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because you want to get anything done. You say, well, how much will this cost? Oh, it'll cost uh, $10,000 for two weeks. You're like, what the heck are you talking about? You know, um, it, you know, it, it can get so bad that like, you know, like let's say you've got like a, you got asthma problem, right? And you're like, I'm feeling like I might have to go to the hospital and get a breathing treatment. But then you think about how much a breathing treatment is going to cost, right? So, you know, what some people do. They drive up to the door of the hospital, sit in the car, and wait it out. That way, if they're desperate, they can run in. But sometimes that part will pass, and it'll, it'll go. It'll, they can get. They can man. It'll be managed over time, and it'll lessen. And then they can go. <laughs> they sit there for hours, and then just go home. Okay, I don't need to go in. But that's how bad it is. When you know you can't even go in and talk to them and get a treatment that might cost you a couple hundred bucks. You know, you're afraid to go in because, my God, what are you going to get slammed with? So, yes, when he gets to physical therapy, long-term care, um, oh, drugs for, like, the drug, there's a new drug for ALS. ALS, $150,000 a year. It's a liquid that you drink on a daily basis. It's highway robbery. It's criminal. Absolutely 100% criminal. It's criminal. So, Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I got nothing nice to say about the entire system. I, I don't. It's just, woof. It is sad. And, and a lot of people, therefore, don't get treated for what they could be treated for. Uh, they can't get something reasonable because it's all or nothing. Um, because you have to fight for almost everything. It's like, okay, can, can you just do this and not do that? You know, um, but the answer to that is often no. We do it, we do it 100% our way. And you don't have any rights as a patient. That is, is, is a big problem. And it's because we know more than you. And therefore, if we decide it has to be done, it should be done. And of course, that was true. In this case, they just thought they had to do their own evaluations and test these things out and not give her the ketamine. And, and were they right? In this instance, as far as a, a future treatment, I think they were. But for a parent who's in there, well, you know, let's, let's, let's take the Munchausen syndrome thing away from her and just say she's a concerned parent. She sort of has to go along with the program, the plan, whatever the plan is. It's hard to fight, especially when it's a child. As an adult, you can, adults can fight it, but I've even seen adults have a really hard time fighting this kind of thing because, because you have people looking at you saying, you need this. This has to be done. And people just cower in front of medical professionals and they'll go along with so many things they should never go along with just because they're being told to do it. Because be, once you walk in, you become like a child yourself. You've given up that power. And it's, it's a creepy situation. That's why I, it, it's funny because I love interpreting. So I can walk into a medical facility feeling just fine. You know, hi, everybody. What's up? And uh, oh, where's, my, where's, where's my patient? Oh, hi. You know, and then I'm interpreting. And everything's fine. And going from room to room. And I'm I'm going to the x-ray and I'm, you know, sitting there helping that. And, you know, that's fine. I go into surgery and I watch that. It's cool. You know, I can do all that. I feel great because I come in as an equal, not as that little, that little patient person down here. But if I have to walk in without working, I know when I work in, walk in, the first thing they say is, oh, look, she's a senior citizen. Oh, look at her. What is she? She probably doesn't know anything. And she probably she's probably one of those people that's really annoying too, because you know, senior citizens, they just sometimes, you know, they're they're so difficult, unless they're one of those sweet ones. <sighs> you feel so belittled when you just walk in the door. It, 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 I just hate it. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I can't I love it. just makes me want to throw up. But I love working. <laughs> it's a totally different feeling. Oh, that's interesting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh what? I'm not, don't go into anything political here, okay? No politics on this channel as far as that goes. All right. I try to keep politics off the channel because then we get all that nasty stuff going on. People's different opinions on politics. So let's not do that. Uh, oh, oh, <laughs> you don't look sick. Oh, oh, by the way, 
I, I haven't asked you this, Sarah, because you will know this one. The pain thing, one to 10. And they show you all the pictures, you know. <laughs> one is, and then by the middle, it's, by the end, it's, right? One to 10, right? You get most of the people come in there, like, like my, my patients, they walk in there, they're laughing and joking. And they say, well, how is your pain level? And they're like, it's a 10. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> I don't see them any pain at all, right? Because they're trying to get like drugs or something, whatever their issues, or they just like to be dramatic. I come in, I came in with like 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 a like real severe pain. Um, was that for the gallbladder attack or something like that? Oh no. No, I had a tubal pregnancy and I was agonizing pain. And I came in to explain that. But then when they said when I was there sitting there's one to ten, well, I'm the type that will be very, very truthful and like i'm like thinking 10 is where i'm screaming and rolling around on the floor so i'm not going to say 10 so maybe i would say i'm a six or something and then they're always assuming that when you say six you really mean three <laughs> you know so then they say oh you don't have anything you clearly don't have anything and so it's like it's, so on one hand they don't believe people because people exaggerate on the other hand if you tell the truth they still think it's exaggerating and think you have even less. So you can't win no matter what you do. What do you, what do you, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, well, if I'm, you no, know, if I'm saying I'm nine, I look like a nine. Well, then you probably are being truthful because you really actually have all that severe pain. So, <laughs> oh Lord. But that, that would be, that would be accurate, Benny. Something t tend to me is like, yeah, ten to ten to me is, I don't know. Yeah, have to be, have to be. To me, see, that's where I put ten. A lot of people put ten at, you know, they have a stomach ache. You know, <laughs> I've seen people with ten. You know, um, uh, let's see, uh, kidney stones. That's pretty. T that a lot of times that's pretty tenish. You know, it really is. I mean, they're in such incredible pain. Uh, so there's reasons for a 10. And of course, people come in with their arm, you know, hanging off and stuff like that, and accidents. And, you know, I, but but uh, that tubal pregnancy was pretty serious. And there was another case of stupidity because I went to the doctor, I, I, I had uh, I, I had this severe pain. And then I, uh, the one of the possibilities, because I, I looked it up, I think I called, it was back in the old days, I called Giant Healthline and said, if you have severe pain, it could be a tubal pregnancy. And I'm like, because I, I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went and got a pregnancy test and it came out positive. And yet I hadn't had any symptoms of pregnancy. So I was really upset. And they thought I was upset at the pregnancy center because I wanted, didn't want a child. And I'm like, no, it's because I think it's a tubal pregnancy. Now, so then I went to a top doctor and he refused to give me a sonogram because he didn't, he thought I was exaggerating. And then, um, so I left his office and I, I, I called up my sister who was a nurse. And she said, well, make sure you're not alone. And and go, I forgot what she told me to go the next day. I went and I thought, oh, I went back to the pregnancy center. They had a doctor there. And while I was there, my blood pressure dropped like a rock. And he said, take her straight to the hospital to my husband. I went to the hospital and I was in surgery and I was, what was I, 12 weeks pregnant, 15 weeks pregnant? Yeah. <laughs> I never had another child after that. That was it. That wiped me out. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would have died. If I, that stupid doctor. And then I called that doctor up and I said, do you know where I am? And he's like, where are like, I'm in the hospital. I just had, I just had surgery for the tubal pregnancy. It did, said I didn't have, I was pissed. Yeah. But see, didn't believe me because I didn't express things the right way. Didn't beg the right way. Didn't look pitiful. Didn't, ha didn't come up with the right pain number. I don't even know, you know, what the issue was. I explained it to him. I said, look, I've had, I've had a gallbladder attack in my life, which is agonizing. And I've also had a birth. This was worse than both of those. Chose not to believe me. That sucks, you know. But that's that's a problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> Man flu is a twelve. Oh, you women don't have any idea how bad that is. <laughs> Benny's here under a pseudonym, which is a good thing for you, Benny. <laughs> oh my God. Ooh, what? Wait, man. Wait, 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 wait. I got cancer, labor. Yeah, they get up there. They definitely get up there. Yeah. Those are some horrible things. Yes, that's for sure. And what was, what was that one? Bone spurs shaped off your shoulder. 
that sounds groovy. Mm, yeah, definitely. It all depends whether, yeah, mm, wow. <laughs> anyway, all right. So those are my thoughts on this. Um, uh, it's, it's a very tricky, tricky case in that there's some shade to throw all the way around, shall we put it that way. Um, but uh, very, very, very sad. Um, definitely had a horrible impact on the family and the kids. The kids, the kids are the ones who suffered the most. And um, yeah, I don't know what this is going to come out of this trial. I'm curious. I, I, you know, probably this, this is the main video I'll do on this. I might do a follow up video, maybe a short, you know, video if I find out something interesting during the trial, and uh, can and it clears up some things or or add some new stuff, I might do that. But you know me, I I'm not a trial follower because I can't sit through hours and hours of the boredom. So I, you know, I know a lot of people sit and watch the entire trial, but I, I, I just don't have the time or energy to do that. So I usually try to read, you know, information that comes out about the trial and hope that it's relatively good. Did I just do this again? Did nobody tell me my microphone was gone again? Oh my God, I've done it again. Can I, did you all even hear me during this show? Oh God, what is wrong with me? I blew it again. I had the microphone on the other side of the table again. Oh my God. Could you actually even hear me? Now I'm really depressed. You sounded great. Really? Ah, you could hear me? Even though the, wow, because do I sound louder now? I mean, I've, I've left the stupid microphone on the side of the table again. Huh. Well, God. Well, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you all heard me well enough because that, that I heard loud and clear. Really? Wow. <laughs> Go figure. I screwed up again. <laughs> I don't know. It was on, really on the other side of the table because that's the second time I've done that. I'm like, I, I just looked, I just looked over there and went, what the? <sighs> oh, that's bizarre. Okay. Well, I'm glad you could hear me. I'm hoping that um, <laughs> when the show has gone public, uh, people can still hear me. <laughs> There's nothing more frustrating. You know, the disappearing act I did the other day. Apparently what happened was when there was, there was a glitch in the something to do with something to do with the internet, whatever. And what it do is it somehow changed the level of doing stuff in front of a green screen. And I, for some reason I couldn't see it when I started. I didn't, I didn't see the white lines here. And normally I would see that, but I did not see it. And so, yeah, I, I was transparent through the whole show. I'm like, <laughs> so embarrassing, but you know me, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't edit cause I can't stand to do that. And sometimes, you know, I look at the show and I, I look at like five minutes, I go, what do I do about this? And then I'm like, oh, well, I don't, I, I can't start over. I can't redo it. I just, I'll just have to let it go. So <laughs> I hope that people get enough out of it. That doesn't drive them insane. <laughs> and, like, and I didn't know what you guys were even really talking about. I couldn't really see it on this end. I was like, but you know, then it was funny because the next time I sat down to do the show, I could see everything the white lines i kept changing the picture and i could see different things you know <laughs> i'm like oh my god what happened and there, there's a little cursor well, it's not, i don't know what you want to call it. you know and it has different numbers it's like this is 48 and but for some reason it had slid over and i don't know why because i didn't push it so but you know me i lose pictures there's going to be something wrong with my mic because you know, i'm going to screw up somewhere <laughs> i'm way better than i was two years ago that's all i can say you know it's like but it's um Let's say I don't, I, I, you know, I put a lot of work into the actual study and the research and doing the shows. I don't have, I don't have the energy to do editing and perfection and all that. It's, it's just not fun either. It's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm good with what I have to, good with the way I do it. So anyway, anyway. Oh, I'm in perf. Oh, I like, <laughs> well, gee, I, I like that. You sound like Mary Poppins. She's just imperfectly perfect. <laughs> I think Mary Poppins was perfect, though. She was never imperfect, if I correctly remember. By the way, just as, a, as, a, just as an aside as we go out, I always loved the Mary Poppins movie, the original. And then one day I read the book, and dang, that book is one of the most horrible things I ever read. Mary Poppins was a psychopath in that book. I mean, a total psychopath. She was a horrible, horrible human being. <laughs> Magical, but horrible. And I'm reading it going, oh, my God. How did they come up with that wonderful show that they managed to tone her down enough not to be as creepy as she is in this book? I don't know if you've ever read the original Mary Poppins book. It's 
it blows me away. I don't know what Walt Disney saw in that book, but he must have somehow seen something. But it was it was horrible. I wouldn't even want a child to read that thing. It was terrible. <laughs> oh goodness. Um. Anyway, all right. So that's it for today. I'm going to go and do whatever I'm going to do. Nah, which is not go to a soccer game because it got rained out. If I'd known that, I wouldn't got up early. But then I was going to go play table tennis and get coaching. My coach is in New York, so I'm screwed. I guess I'll watch movies or something. Maybe I'll take a day off after this. Maybe I'll go back to bed so the, the mouse that's in my room might be asleep now. I don't know how to get rid of that mouse. I don't want to kill it. I just, but he's like so bold now. He's like, I mean, I open up the door and he's like, hi. And I, I can't catch him quick enough. And then he's like, I can, he just, even in the day, he just runs across the floor and waves at me. I'm like, really? It's like, <laughs> oh my God. Oh no, it didn't. Well, interestingly, it did before the show started. So uh, this is the argument I'm having with Verizon. I'm like, why is it just cutting out? And they say, oh, well, it was a glitch. I'm like, well, is it going to keep glitching? So right before I did the show, it went out. And I was like, thinking, oh, my God, is this going to happen again? So, yeah, I'm very frustrated with it, but I'm glad it didn't crash. And I, I don't know why I'm having this problem all of a sudden. Everything was good for a while. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, watch it. I already saw Watch Heavenly Creatures. That I've already, that I've already seen. Oh, thank you, Pat. Great teacher as always. You need to be house shopping in account of the mouse. It's, it's, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I used to have, you know, pet mice for my granddaughter and they were they're adorable, cute. Um, and uh, we had all kinds of, you know, little little trail things, you know, that they run through and it was big. We had two houses for them with the connections and all kinds of, it was really neat. And we did that during COVID. So I like mice and uh, I like rats. I like them all. But, you know, the thing was chew under my bed and I'm like, what the heck? It was so loud. I thought a raccoon had gotten in the house and I'm like, but it wasn't, it's just, it's just, it's just a regular mouse. And I'm like, it was the loudest mouse I've ever come in contact with. And then he goes up into my drawer next to my, and he rattles through everything. And I don't know what he's doing up there. Cause there's no food in there and he hasn't chewed anything, but he likes it. One o'clock in the morning, he likes to go through the thing as long as the lights are out and I'm not moving. As soon as I move, of course he stops, but. <laughs> It's, it's crazy. I don't know how to catch that stupid thing. Oh my gosh. He's not a, no, he's not a dirty little vermin. He's a cute little guy. I like mice. It's just not useful in my house, you know, outside of a cage, but you know, <laughs> I like animals in all kinds of forms. I do. I, I enjoy, I find them fascinating to watch. So, you know, um, it's just a fascinating little mouse, but how he's escaping my trap twice now, because I got the big bucket and I got the thing on top where you, the thing goes like this. And I got peanut butter on the end of it. And I heard this in the middle of the night. I'm like, yes, I got him. And I look in there. And there's no mouse. I'm like, now I caught two other mice because there, there were two smaller mice. And I got them last week. So, and now I just seem to be down to one mouse. But the other two I caught and I let them go. And this one is, is too smart. It's just, I don't know how he's not ending up down there. So I keep trying because I don't want to hurt the little guy. So this is cute. He's a cute guy. <laughs> no, I won't do that. I cannot do that. It's cruel. Oh, and caught a baby snake instead. Yeah, that, that grosses me out. I, I can't kill. I can't kill pet. I mean, animals. I just can't do it. I let the, I, I let bugs out the door, you know, and all that stuff. I'm one of those. So I, I don't like to hurt them. But I would like to catch them because I can't sleep at night now because the thing, I mean, between one and what, one and four in the morning is he's busy for three hours right next to my bed, under my bed runs across the room, jumps. I mean, I make so much noise. I can't believe it's a mouse. I kept thinking something else was in there, at least a rat, but it wasn't a rat. One little mouse. Crazy. But anyway, okay. That's it for today. I hope you, sorry about the early hour. If I had known everything was going to change, I would have done it later because I hate getting up in the morning and yeah, but so be it. And I'm glad you all were here. And it was, it was a tricky subject, um, but uh, I'm, when I'm asked to do the things, I, I try to do them. And whether I get whether I whether I get monetized or demonetized on my videos, uh, I still do them uh, if I can. You know, unless it's something really concerning that I don't want to talk about at all, like politics um, on this channel. Uh, but you know, sometimes I just take the hit because it, you know it's nothing you can do about it. But yeah, 
I still like to bring the content to you because I still think it's educational and it should happen. And uh, that's what my channel is about. So anyway, thank you all for being here. You're all great as usual. And I can't believe you could hear me. And after all, I still can't believe. <laughs> uh, anyway, I will see you for a hangout during the week, hopefully. Um, and hopefully, they've demonetized my last two hangouts. Hopefully this one will be, I don't watch my content. I really have to watch my content list. <laughs> Not, not upset people. Anyway, thank you for being here. Bye.